The German Communist Resistance, 1933 through 1945, by T. Durbent. To my mother, an anti fascist. To my father, an anti fascist. Each in their own way. T. D. Preface From German Communist Anti Fascism to a Contemporary United Front, by Devin Zane Shaw. Reconstructing a Communist Anti Fascist History. Teter Bend is a communist theorist of military strategy, whose research and writing focus on the influence of Clausewitz's theories on revolutionary thought. His categories of revolutionary military policy, Kersplebedeb 2006, already circulates within militant circles due to its concise taxonomy of different types of revolutionary struggle. Soon two other works will join that work in the present volume in English translation to be published by Foreign Languages Press. Clausewitz à la guerre populaire, 2004, and De Foucault ou Brigades Rogues, 2018. The German Communist Resistance, 1933 through 1945, is to some degree an outlier in Durbin's work, if not a detour. It was first published in 2008 and then reprinted in 2012, with the addition of two interviews with the author as appendances. In those interviews, he explains how he discovered unpublished archival materials documenting widespread clandestine resistance on the part of the German Communist Party, KPD, which is typically minimized or omitted from Western historiography. After failing to persuade others to follow up on this line of research, Durbin finally decided to take on the project himself, thus correcting a glaring historical omission in Western historiography. Including anti fascist historiography, no less of the history of German communist resistance in Nazi Germany. In broad outline, the received history of Nazi Germany holds that Nazi repression of socialist and communist opposition was swift. The main Communist Party leaders were arrested and detained in concentration camps, while many thousands of cadres went into exile to fight fascism from abroad. A viable resistance only begins in the late 1930s, organized by anti-Hitler factions of the bourgeoisie and aristocracy, the Kreisau Circle, or their, quote, heirs, unquote, the conspirators who carried out an assassination attempt on Hitler on July 20th, 1944, or among small networks of heroic dissidents such as the White Rose Group, whose best-known members are Hans and Sophie Scholl. Communist resistance is not entirely omitted from this received history, but it is said to re-enter near the end of the war, and it is grouped with socialist and Christian resistance. However, grouping these forms of resistance together, in Durbin's terms, a quote, sham, unquote, Christian and socialist resistance was carried out by individuals or small networks. By comparison, quote, only the communist resistance embraced all possible forms of struggle, propaganda, sabotage, guerrilla warfare, espionage, union struggle, etc., it is the only one to have fought from the first to the last day of the Third Reich, and to have extended its action to the whole of Germany, even in the camps and in the army. Finally, it is the only one to have really weakened the Nazi war machine." Unquote. Furthermore, although anti-fascist historiography acknowledges the role that the KPD played in numerous anti-fascist organizations, such as anti-fasciste action, the discussion typically ends where Durbin's accounts take off with the Nazi repression of the Communist Party in 1933. While clandestine work lacks the organizing capacity that open resistance has available to it, that does not nullify its impacts. The reader notes a certain amount of repetition as repression fails to stop resistance. KPD organizations carry out clandestine action. They are dismantled by the Gestapo. Dozens if not hundreds of militants are rounded up and imprisoned or executed. The organizations are reconstituted and returned to action. In the midst of this repression, communist resistance carried out propaganda campaigns, supported strikes and sabotage of the war industry, and organized resistance in the army and in concentration camps. Durbin also catalogs communist involvement in exile, in the Spanish Civil War, and in other occupied countries. Durbin's short intervention is admittedly not exhaustive. It only aims to give a representative picture of the scope and importance of communist resistance. By focusing almost exclusively on the KPD, he shows that the communist resistance followed in practice a remarkably consistent clandestine policy of opposition to Nazism, even as the Soviet Union's and common turns political line shifts over time. 
Indeed, Durbin presents some evidence that the Soviet-aligned militants of the KPD continue to carry out clandestine actions against the Nazis during the period of the non-aggression pact between Germany and the Soviet Union. I would conclude on this basis that when Durbin contends that German communist resistance maintained a continuous opposition to Nazism, this continuity was one of military policy rather than political policy. A continuity that is perhaps legible only when we focus, as Durbin's analysis frequently does, on the former rather than the latter. There's a relationship between the two that Durbin could have developed further. In any case, the clandestine resistance he describes dwarfs that of the individuals and groups typically celebrated in popular Western historiography. And yet, today the reader will be surprised to discover the quantity of munitions and planes rendered inoperable by communist sabotage. These historical omissions are the result of a Western, anti-communist political consensus, which continues to treat communism and fascism as two sides of the same totalitarian coin. And yet, Today, just as yesterday, supposedly liberal and progressive but anti-communist blocs attempt to make peace with far-right and fascistic political tendencies in order to shore up capitalist hegemony. Anti-fascist historiography, at least in the English-speaking world, tends to date the emergence of modern militant anti-fascism around 1946 with the formation of the 43 Group in England. The 43 Group, which was comprised mainly, but not exclusively, of Jewish veterans of World War II used physical confrontation to break up public meetings and rallies of a variety of fascist groups. They used direct action to undermine fascist organizing because the typical liberal mechanisms of social mediation, a combination of the inculcation of liberal norms, the so-called marketplace of ideas, and law enforcement, do not. Indeed, liberal norms and legislation tend to permit far-right or fascist organizing on the basis of freedom of speech and association, while police are sympathetic to far-right groups for a variety of reasons, reasons we will return to below. In light of the failures of liberal mechanisms to halt fascist organizing, the 43 group carried out its actions as a form of, quote, communal defense, unquote. M. Testa summarizes this period of anti-fascist struggle in terms which are contemporary enough. Quote, Militant anti-fascists found themselves in a three-cornered fight against both fascists and the police. Anti-fascists were statistically three times more likely to be arrested than fascists. The police justified this by interpreting anti-fascist activity as aggressive and thus, wittingly or not, acted as stewards for fascist meetings to, quote, preserve the peace, unquote. While anti-Semitism and even fascist sympathies among law enforcement certainly played a part in police actions, quote, the police were never convinced that the group was apolitical and not secretly communist. Consequently, like their communist allies, the anti-fascist ex-servicemen were seen as radical agitators, desperate to overturn the status quo, unquote. If the modern history of militant anti-fascism typically takes the 43 group as its point of departure, it is because the group took on the three-way fight against both system oppositional far-right and fascist groups and law enforcement or more broadly, the repressive apparatus of bourgeois class rule. This three-way fight would be familiar to anti-fascists out in the streets of North America, and elsewhere, over the last five years. But the volatile events of the last year during the pandemic showed that the political coordinates of struggle are both volatile and subject to rapid change. In my view, Durban offers us a window into a particularly important moment, the struggle between the KPD and the German Social Democratic Party, SPD, during the rise of the Nazi Party, from a theoretically fruitful angle. There is a temptation when revisiting the failures of the KPD and SPD as the Nazis ascended to political power to relitigate their ideological debates in order to settle political scores. It may be impossible not to belie one's commitments when analyzing these failures. Derbent, for his part, takes a critical approach to the KPD's political line by contextualizing it via social antagonism, he writes, quote, The communist leadership believed that the anti-fascist struggle involved the elimination of social democratic influence in the proletariat, because this influence distanced the class from a genuine anti-fascist and anti-capitalist struggle. This analysis had two premises. The first, erroneous, was the widespread idea at the time that the Nazi movement would not withstand the test of power, that it would crack both because of the workers' opposition and because of its internal contradictions. But the second premise of the KPD's analysis was correct, 
the will to fight Hitlerism was totally lacking in social democracy. The SPD's legalism led it to fight the communists rather than the Nazis, unquote. On this basis, Der Bent analyzes two related political lines held by the KPD in the run-up to the Nazis taking power in 1933. First, the, quote, third period, unquote, policy, which held that socialists were, quote, social fascists, unquote. That is, social democrats function as a moderate wing of fascism, allied with the bourgeoisie against communism. And second, the two-front struggle of the, quote, united front at the base, unquote, which consisted of fighting socialist leadership and organizations while building up alliances with SPD rank and file. We will begin with the latter. As Drabent notes, the united front at the base policy resulted in an ambivalent political question. Quote, the KPD could do or not do anything. It served, quote, objectively, unquote, either the Social Democrats or the Nazis, unquote. It led, infamously, to the KPD's participation in a Nazi-inspired referendum against the Social Democratic government in Prussia in 1931. Drabent hints at the internal struggles within the KPD when deciding these policies, but does not underline the policies that resulted in the failures of the United Front at the base. Here, I find Nikos Palenza's verdict persuasive. The KPD relied on, quote, electoral struggle as the favored form of mass action, unquote. At the same time, he adduces evidence that the KPD failed to set up united front organizations which could cement alliances between communists and the rank and file of the Social Democrats. Part of the failure on the united front from the base policy can be placed on the line that the socialists were social fascist. Derbent departs from the typical reception of this part of the third period line. Some critics relegate the third period to the Stalinization of the common turn, where, quote, Moscow politics often influence continental anti-fascist strategy more than Italian or German realities, unquote. But this emphasizes external factors over contradictions internal to these, quote, German realities, unquote. By contrast, Derbent argues that the social fascist line was validated by the fact that social democrats repeatedly used the repressive state apparatus to quell communist organizing. The failure of the KPD and the SPD to align against the Nazis was not merely ideological, but also driven by antagonism between communist insurrectionism and the SPD, which presided at the helm of the repressive state apparatus. The socialist adherence of legalism, which brought repressive state power to bear on communist organizing, also put them at odds with cadre on the ground who sought a more militant line for the Iron Front, the SPD's anti-fascist fighting organization. Yet communists failed to seize the opportunity. As Polancis writes, quote, As far as the line itself is concerned, the inclusive designation of social democracy and the social democratic trade unions as social fascist and as the main enemy bore heavy responsibility for the failure of the United Front. This was not so much because of the refusal of all contact between the leaderships, and even between the secondary ranks. It was particularly because of the policy toward the social democratic masses, considered, quote, lost, unquote, as long as they were under the influence of social democracy. Even apart from the fact that the KPD's main activity was still directed against social democracy, this activity was conceived of as a struggle between, quote, organizations, unquote, not as a mass struggle on a mass line, unquote. Though the KPD sought to form a united front with the social democratic workers in principle, they failed to translate this into practice. The, quote, social fascist, unquote, label, in my view, is a symbol of this failure to build a mass struggle around a united front, and it lives on as an inflammatory epithet, largely doing the same work today. Nonetheless, what I have tried to excavate via Derbent is how, at the time, the misguided terminology reflected, in a partial way, social realities on the ground. While socialists and communists had a common enemy, organizationally they occupied structurally different social positions. One commanded state power, and the other's insurrectionary strategy was repeatedly quashed by the repressive state apparatus. But the KPD also failed to focus on the struggle beyond these organizational parameters. We must underline this kernel of truth while dispensing with the husk which belies how communists underestimated the strength of emerging threat of fascism. Toward a contemporary united front. It might seem that we are far from discussing the praxis of a contemporary united front. On the contrary, I have attempted to outline and have perhaps belabored the various points of antagonism between the SPD and the KPD 
In order to anticipate a series of ideological and structural pressures that militant anti-fascists could face during the Biden administration. If we remove the historical labels and replace them with contemporary terms, these pressures will become more obvious. Given that militant anti-fascist groups today tend to organize around a united front policy, the differences between socialist, anarchist, or Marxist is not really as profound as the split between militant anti-fascism and liberal anti-fascism. Militant anti-fascism upholds the diversity of tactics to combat far-right and fascist organizing, organizes as a form of community self-defense, which, at least ideally, builds reciprocal relationships with marginalized and oppressed communities, while recognizing the, quote, revolutionary horizon, unquote, of anti-fascist struggle. Fascism cannot be permanently defeated until the conditions which give rise to fascism are overthrown. Depending on the context, as we will see below, other conditions might be present, such as settler colonialism. Liberal anti-fascism, in Mark Bray's concise definition, entails, quote, a faith in the inherent power of the public sphere to filter out fascist ideas, and in the institution of government to forestall the advancement of fascist politics, unquote. Liberal anti-fascists appeal to the democratic norms of these institutions, but also assume that law enforcement will apply force to repress the fascism when it constitutes a legitimate threat. They also often appeal to the converse of this position. If law enforcement doesn't intervene, then no legitimate threat is present. While militant anti-fascism is best known for the embrace of the diversity of tactics, over the past several years many anti-fascists have worked to create a broader social atmosphere of everyday anti-fascism. Fostering everyday anti-fascism makes it possible to organize a broader movement which would challenge far-right groups when they mobilized in various cities across North America. Everyday anti-fascism could, under the right conditions, bring larger crowds to counter-protests. It also provides political education on how the seemingly small things, like seating far-right groups at restaurants or providing lodging, enabled the far-right threat to communities. With Trump in office, there was no chance that anti-fascism could be funneled back toward an affirmation of American civic participation. A Biden administration poses different problems. In August 2017, only a few weeks after the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Biden published an editorial in The Atlantic denouncing Trump's equivocations about the far right. He also referenced Charlottesville repeatedly during his campaign. In and of themselves, these denunciations didn't drive his electoral messaging. But in light of the far right raid on the Capitol, and the popular outrage which also accompanied this action, Biden is positioned to siphon parts of the broader atmosphere of everyday anti fascism, which previously made it possible to organize militant anti fascist actions relatively openly to fortify Democratic voting coalitions. This co-optation of a weak sense of even liberal anti-fascist sentiment will drive the narrative that fascism, encapsulated and isolated as so-called, quote, Trumpism, unquote, was defeated with the victory and inauguration of the Biden administration, when in fact the far right was diverted from system-loyal tendencies aligning with Trump and the Republican Party back towards system oppositional forms of government. If this occurs, the Biden administration can work to legitimate liberal currents of anti-fascism while delegitimating, while applying the force of the repressive state apparatus toward militant currents. If liberal anti-fascism succeeds in pulling everyday anti-fascism back towards forms of bourgeois forms of institutional cultural power, it will effectively empty everyday anti-fascism of any concrete political and organizational content, while setting the stage for state repression of militant anti-fascists. Any extension of law enforcement powers that follow in the wake of far-right actions related to the Capitol riot will redound against left-wing militants. What liberals will portray as the instringence of militant anti-fascists will appear to them as an ideological victory, but it will be won with repressive state violence, dismantling militant anti-fascist organizations and undermining community self-defense. The foregoing scenario is far from a fait accompli. It can be forestalled by renewed efforts at militant political education and organizing around a united front policy. The defeat of the Trump administration has untethered far-right organizing from its system-loyal pretensions, though without necessarily undermining alliances forged by the mutual opposition of some far-right groups and police departments to the anti-police uprisings of 2020. I will conclude by proposing a series of theses concerning a united front policy for militant anti-fascists in North America though I believe some points would also hold in other situations. I defend them in more detail elsewhere. 
we will begin with defining two terms, fascism and the far right. 1. Fascism is a social movement involving a relatively autonomous and insurgent potentially mass base, driven by an authoritarian vision of collective rebirth that challenges bourgeois institutional and cultural power while re-entrenching economic and social hierarchies. This definition of fascism, adapted from the work of Matthew N. Lyons and drawing from the discussion between Don Hammerquist and Jay Sakai in Confronting Fascism, 2002, is a marked departure from the most common Marxist definition, which holds that fascism is, quote, the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialist elements of finance capital, unquote. Whereas Dimitrov's formulation, as it is typically applied, treats fascists in the streets as instruments of the most reactionary faction of capital. The definition I offer asserts that fascist social movements are relatively autonomous formations that challenge bourgeois institutional and cultural power. This autonomy does not preclude hegemonic formations between fascists and the bourgeoisie. As Hammerquist argues, the Nazi seizure of power united factions of the ruling class interested in imposing fascism, quote, from above, unquote, with non-socialist factions and I'm using the term socialist as loosely as possible here, of the fascist movement and, quote, Nazi political structure had a clear and substantial autonomy from the capitalist class and the strength to impose certain positions on that class, unquote. As to the class composition of fascism, Durbin comments that, quote, workers were the only social group whose percentage of Nazi party members was lower than its percentage in the total population, unquote. Closer to the present, an examination of 49 of 107 persons arrested for participation in the Capitol riot indicates the generally petty bourgeois character of participants. Both observations affirm that the class composition of the far right and fascism is more complex than the most reactionary factions of the bourgeoisie. In North America, the far right draws from elements of the white petty bourgeoisie who are seeking to protect their social status purchased, as W.E.B. Du Bois argues, through the wages of whiteness and or their class position. Fascism is, in my view, relatively autonomous because it is anti-bourgeois, but anti-capitalist only to the degree that it seeks to reorganize capital accumulation on terms conducive to its base. 2. Fascist ideology and organizing develops within a broader far-right ecological niche. Lyons defines the far right as inclusive of, quote, political forces that a, regard human inequality as natural, inevitable, or desirable, and b, reject the legitimacy of the established political system, unquote. Lyons' definition focuses our attention on two key features of the far right milieu, within which fascists organize. First, far right groups seek to re-entrench social and economic inequalities, but the social hierarchies they advocate are necessarily drawn along racial lines. Lyons gives the example of the Christian far right, which advocates for a theocratic state that centers heterosexual male dominance. In general, this movement has embraced Islamophobia and, quote, promotes policies that implicitly bolster racial oppression, unquote. But some groups have conducted outreach to conservative Christians of color, while others have formed alliances with white supremacist groups. Fascist movements emerge within a broader milieu of right-wing social movements, and these various groups sometimes establish alliances and sometimes conflict. In fact, one purpose of anti-fascist counter-protesting when these groups rally is to put pressure on their organizing. When these rallies are disrupted or dispersed through anti-fascist action, far-right alliances often rapidly splinter as prominent figures in groups within the far-right trade accusations and recriminations. Second, far-right groups reject the legitimacy of, as I would phrase it, bourgeois democratic institutions of political and cultural power. Though mainstream conservatism has been pulled toward the far-right in ideological terms, organizational differences between, quote, oppositional and system loyal rightists is more significant than ideological differences about race, religion, economics, or other factors, unquote. 3. Militant anti-fascism is involved in a three-way fight against insurgent far-right movements in bourgeois democracy, or in ideological terms, liberalism. More precisely, each quote corner-unquote of the three-way fight struggles against the other two at the same time the struggle offers lines of adjacency against a common enemy. The first and most fundamental lesson of the three-way fight is that while both revolutionary movements and far-right movements are insurgent, Forms of opposition against bourgeois democracy, quote, 
my enemy's enemy is not my friend, unquote. Given that far-right groups also aim to recruit or ally with some revolutionary leftist groups, it is all the more important to root out all forms of chauvinism within our practices and organizations. Second, we must recognize the line of adjacency between militant anti-fascism and the egalitarian aspirations of bourgeois democracy. It is the shared appeal to egalitarianism which makes fostering a broader sense of everyday anti-fascism possible. But it also means, as I will argue in Thesis 6, that militants must uphold a revolutionary horizon to keep the limitations of liberal anti-fascism in focus. We will deal with the line of adjacency between the far-right and bourgeois democracy, or liberalism, in the next two theses. But before moving on, we must examine the relationship between far-right groups and law enforcement. The slogan that, quote, cops and Klan go hand-in-hand, hand, unquote, expresses two fundamental aspects of this relationship. First, it acknowledges the systemic role of law enforcement, that is, law enforcement protects the systemic white supremacy of North American settler colonial states. Second, it also emphasizes not only common membership between the two groups, when police, for example, are also members of the KKK, but also the ideological bases, through which police and system-loyal vigilante groups find common cause in opposition to leftist movements. However, it would be incorrect to assume that there are no antagonisms between law enforcement and far-right groups. In my view, it is more accurate to differentiate between what I would call system-loyal vigilantism and system oppositional armed organization. On the terms established by Lyons, all far-right groups are ideologically system oppositional, but not all of them are organized in system oppositional forms. Over the last few years, many frame their actions as system loyal vigilantism, which I would define as the use of violent tactics to harass, intimidate, or physically harm individuals or groups participating in transformative egalitarian movements. While some levels of law enforcement tend to be permissive or deferential towards system-loyal right-wing vigilantism, at least at the federal level, law enforcement has moved to repress system oppositional groups organized around armed insurgency. In 2020 alone, police moved to incapacitate numerous far-right armed accelerationist groups, including members of the base, Atomwaffen, and the more loosely affiliated Boogaloo movement. We must not mistake law enforcement repression to signal an unequivocal antagonism between police and the far right, or any degree of common cause between these targeted far right groups and militant and revolutionary leftist movements. 4. The particularity of the three way fight is dependent on concrete social relations. Far right and fascist groups draw on and respond differently to different social contexts. For example, during the interwar period, Fascist movements drew from the imperialist aspirations of European nationalisms. In North America, far-right movements emerge in relation to broader ideological and material forms of settler colonialism, which includes, meaning that capital accumulation is imbricated in, elements of white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, ableism, and indigenous dispossession. In North America, the historical development of liberal political and cultural institutions is inseparable from the development of settler colonialism. Nonetheless, it would be undialectical to treat them uncritically as the same thing. Instead, in my view, it is more precise to contend that settler state hegemony is formed by the mediation of bourgeois liberalism and white supremacist settlerism. I would define white supremacist settlerism as an ideological framework which privileges both white entitlement to land, possession, or dominion over the colonized rights to sovereignty and autonomy and entitlements encapsulated in what W.E.B. Du Bois called the, quote, public and psychological wage of whiteness, unquote. Examining the end of the Reconstruction period in the southern United States after the Civil War, Du Bois argues that the potential for the formation of abolition democracy built on the solidarity between the black and white proletariat, was defeated by the hegemonic reorganization of settler state hegemony, which ensured forms of deference and the institutionalization of racial control, as well as opening institutional access to education and social mobility to poor whites, drawing them, even if only aspirationally, into the petty bourgeois and labor aristocracy. Du Bois' analysis remains the prototype though it must be theoretically corrected by incorporating the role that the settlement of the Western frontier played in this dynamic, for conceptualizing settler state hegemony and the role that whiteness plays within it. The presidential campaigns of 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, and then the widespread anti-police uprising, offered two competing visions of reorganizing American settler state hegemony, 
one which attempted to pull some system oppositional far-right movements into system loyalty, and the other which took on a form of superficial anti-fascism. But it also demonstrated that a common interest in maintaining settler state hegemony against challenges from the revolutionary left and the liberation struggles of oppressed peoples forms the basis of the line of adjacency between bourgeois liberalism and white supremacist settlerism. 5. Far-right movements are system-loyal when they perceive that the entitlement of white supremacy can be advanced within bourgeois or democratic institutions, and they become insurgent when they perceive that these entitlements cannot. In the first thesis, I stated that fascist groups appeal to an authoritarian vision of collective rebirth. In North American settler colonial societies, far-right and fascist groups demand the re-entrenchment of the social and economic hierarchies, which enabled white social and economic mobility. They perceive that their social standing is in jeopardy and demand that settler state hegemony be tilted, quote, back, unquote, toward their advantage. In sum, far-right movements asserted supposed, quote, rights, unquote, of white settlerism, which supersede the formal guarantees and protections granted through the liberal institutions of settler state hegemony. I would suggest that liberalism and white settlerism were historically able to coexist because the latter's interests did not interfere with the former's. Fascism failed to emerge as a profound challenge to American political hegemony in the 1930s and 1940s because, as Sakai notes, quote, white settler colonialism and fascism occupied the same ecological niche, having one capitalist society didn't yet need the other, unquote. In the 1950s to the 1970s, a variety of civil rights and liberation movements leveled a profound challenge to settler state hegemony. Liberalism accommodated challenges from social justice movements by extending formal legal protections to marginalized groups and introducing new patterns of economic redistribution or social welfare. This did not overturn the expectations and entitlements of the wages of whiteness. As Cheryl Harris contends, quote, after legalized segregation was overturned, Whiteness as property evolved into a more modern form through the law's ratification of the settled expectations of relative white privilege as a legitimate natural baseline, unquote. In other words, white entitlements would be codified into law as long as they could be framed in supposedly colorblind terms. But these colorblind terms would also contribute to the incorrect perception that systematic white supremacy has been pushed to the margins of American society. As recent events reveal, Settler state hegemony is not immune to crisis. As Marx and Engels argue in the Communist Manifesto, the social position of the petty bourgeoisie is always tenuous because, quote, their diminutive capital does not suffice for the scale on which modern industry is carried on, unquote. While the white petty bourgeoisie has repeatedly been, quote, bought off, unquote, by social mobility or access to land, available due to indigenous dispossession, even during the period of neoliberal policy. That does not mean that settler state hegemony will continue to reorganize future hegemonic blocs successfully. The threat remains that an insurgent fascist movement, organized around the rebirth of the settler colonial project, will fill that hegemonic vacuum. 6. A revolutionary horizon is a necessary component to anti-fascist organizing. That is, there is no meaningful way in which fascism can be permanently defeated without overthrowing the conditions which give rise to it capitalism and white supremacy, and in North America, settler colonialism. Militant anti-fascism is organized in order to meet the imminent threat of fascist organizing. It is an instantation of community self-defense. A united front is necessary in situations where the revolutionary left is present but lacks a mass base. But it is always caught in a contradiction. The major leftist ideological currents, socialism, anarchism, and communism, converge in a united front, but diverge around the particulars of the revolutionary horizon. While combating fascism is the immediate task of militant anti-fascism, anti-fascists must maintain a revolutionary horizon, even if only in broad outline, in order to avoid being absorbed within the ideological parameters of liberal anti-fascism. At the same time, militants must also recognize that anti-fascist work cannot merely be absorbed into revolutionary work, Anti-fascism is community self-defense. 7. Militant anti-fascism must uphold the diversity of tactics. From a practical perspective, militant anti-fascism is distinguished from liberal anti-fascism by a willingness to use the diversity of tactics, up to and including physical confrontation, to disrupt far-right organizing. Effective militant organizing, though, must not transform the diversity of tactics into merely physical confrontation. 
Anti-fascism seeks to raise the cost of fascist organizing, and that is the most obvious reason that the diversity of tactics plays an important role in organizing. As Robert F. Williams observed in 1962, racists, quote, are the most vicious and violent when they can practice violence with impunity, unquote. Physical confrontation raises the stakes of fascist attempts to harass and intimidate communities as they organize. But it is important to emphasize that physical confrontation still tends to come late in practice. Anti-fascists conduct research and publicize the fascist threats and dox fascists. We put pressure on supposedly community-accountable institutions to de-platform or no-platform far-right groups. When fascists rally, we meet them in the streets to disrupt their actions. Militants uphold the importance of the diversity of tactics, but that doesn't mean, against popular conceptions, that violence is necessary. The critical question is always, which tactic can cause the greatest disruption of far-right movements at each stage of organizing? Events of the last year especially have revealed the weaknesses of liberal mechanisms to stem far-right organizing. For years, liberal anti-fascists interpreted the lack of law enforcement pressure against the far-right as a lack of urgent threat. And when the potential scope for far-right violence erupted into popular consciousness on January 6, 2021, it was years too late. The failure of far-right and fascist groups to undermine the transition of government power was due not to police repression, in fact there was a distinct absence of police repression on that particular day, but primarily to internal organizational weaknesses, which I would attribute in part to pressure brought to bear on these groups over the last five years of anti-fascist organizing. When confronted with emerging far-right movements, and unlike liberal anti-fascists, militant anti-fascists act sooner so that we don't have to take greater risks later. Anti-fascists must maintain a revolutionary horizon, but at the same time remain focused on the immediate threat of fascist organizing. A world where fascists can openly organize is worse than one where they cannot. Draben's book testifies to the contributions and sacrifices made by German communist anti-fascists until a much more overwhelming military response deposed fascism from political power. Though German fascism and Italian fascism were historically defeated in 1945, it will take a greater effort to defeat fascism once and for all. Part of that work must be done now by a united front of militant anti-fascists. Introduction A Resistance That Cannot Be Found According to Claude David, quote, until 1938, there was no organized resistance in Germany, unquote. This is also the opinion of Elaine de Roche, who attributes its birth in 1939 to aristocrats and the big bourgeoisie. Quote, the first desire to oppose Hitler's ideology and the Führer's policies had originated on the eve of the Second World War in a seigneurial estate in Kreisau. The estate belonged to Count Helmuth James von Moltke, founder of the Kreisau Circle, which became the first nucleus of the opposition to Nazism. Among them were liberals and conservatives, aristocrats and clergymen, landowners and industrialists, lawyers and professors, unquote. As for the workers, according to David Schoenbaum, quote, they failed, in any effective sense, to produce resistance. Their marginal protest in the years of 1933 through 39 was economic, not political, a matter of wages and hours not, it seems, of fundamental opposition, unquote. In his monumental study on the Third Reich, William Scherer devotes more than 100 pages to the anti-Hitler resistance. They are all entirely devoted to the plotters of July 20th, 1944, heirs of the Kreisau Circle, and to the Catholic White Rose of Hans and Sophie Scholl. The communist resistance merits only a footnote. In the 800 pages that Peter Hoffman devoted to the German resistance against Hitler, only a few dozen lines are devoted to the communist resistance. In the chapter on resistance to Nazism in the book by Mao and Krausnick, only the plotters of July 20th and the Scholls are mentioned, without even a mention of communist resistance. The same absence is present in Peter Rassau's summation and in Alfred Grosser's study. Quote, the 1940s and 1941 saw opposition at its lowest point. After the defeat of Stalingrad, the atmosphere changed. From then on, the resistance was to be composed of two very different yet inextricably intertwined currents. One included those who wanted to defeat Hitler in order to make Nazi barbarism disappear. It was embodied in the admirable figures of the students Hans and Sophie Scholl, executed in Munich in the spring of 1943 after a sham trial. The other tendency also wanted to rid Germany of Hitler, but only because he was leading it to disaster. 
This tendency was to be particularly popular among the senior officers of the army and in certain leading circles, unquote. The non-existence of communist resistance seems to be unanimously accepted that, far from discussing it, Francois George Dreyfus proposes instead to explain it, quote, The first resistance to Nazism could have come from the socialist or communist left. Now, let us recall that as early as February 1933, the main leaders of the KPD were arrested and sent to Dachau and Oranienburg, and about 15 to 20,000 left-wing leaders went into exile abroad. Their resistance was thus carried out outside the Reich, and their impact, reduced from the outset, very quickly weakened. The grassroots militants, with the exception of a few particularly courageous ones, hid or rallied by joining the SA or the NSKK, or the Labor Front, not hesitating to militate there to make people forget their past, unquote. This analysis is also that of Gerhard Ritter and Kurt Zenter. Henry Bogdan is one of the rare authors who acknowledges communist activity, but he traces it back to the declaration of war against the USSR in June 1941, quote, The second resistance, the first being that of exiled politicians and intellectuals, the real one, the one that was on the ground and under the constant threat of incurring the wrath of the regime, came from three different milieus, the churches, the conservative movements, and the army. The communist militants, for a long time passive and somewhat confused by the German-Soviet pact, organized their resistance from the summer of 1941 onwards with leafleting and sabotage, unquote. Alan Dulles proposed the same vision, quote, it was not until Russia was invaded that the communist underground revived, unquote. What is surprising in this beautiful unanimity, we do not consider the nuances between these points of view as differences, is not that these assertions are false, it is the extreme abundance of the evidence of their falsehood. This effort did not require a lot of hard work on the part of the author. It was enough for him to have access to East German historiography and to cross-check the information with Western historiography. It will therefore be less a question of establishing than of, quote, introducing, unquote, a historical truth, and thus unmasking the falsifiers of history as a tribute to those they have murdered a second time. Chapter 1, The KPD in the Face of the Rise of Hitlerism in the 1930s, the KPD and its mass organizations had organized up to 1 million people and collected up to 6 million votes. By the 1920s, it had developed an impressive political military apparatus for proletarian revolution under the leadership of the Militar Apparat, which performed the functions of staff, security, and intelligence service. This secret organization was in close contact with the state security services of the Soviet Union, the GPU, then the NKVD and with the clandestine apparatus of the Communist International, more precisely the Westboro Pesh Borough der Common Turn, or Westboro led by George Dimitrov. The basis of the Communist political military apparatus was a mass paramilitary organization, the League of Red Front Fighters, Roten Front Kampferbund. This organization and its youth organization, the Roter Jungsturm, which had more than 100,000 members, provided military training for the militants, ensured the protection of demonstrations and picket lines, forcibly prevented bailiffs from expropriating working-class families, and disputed the streets with Nazi militiamen. Banned in 1929, the Roten Front Kampferbund acted under the cover of the Kampfbund gegen den Faschmus, known as the, quote, Antifa League, unquote, which organized 250,000 militants. Between 1928 and 1933, the SA increased the number of Sturmlokalen in working-class neighborhoods, which served as meeting places, propaganda centers, and bistros. The KPD decided on an offensive to eliminate these sites and launched the shock groups of the Antifa League against them. From December 1930 to December 1931, this offensive resulted in 79 Nazi and 103 communist deaths. Of the latter, 51 were killed by Nazis and almost all others by the police of the Social Democratic government who, in the name of maintaining law and order, flew to the rescue of the Nazi sites. The offensive against the Sturmlokal in SA was halted to prevent the KPD from being banned like the Roten Front Kampferbund. One reads endlessly that the KPD, through its excessive struggle against the Social Democrats, paved the way for Hitler. The communist leadership believed that the anti-fascist struggle involved the elimination of Social Democratic influence in the proletariat, because this influence distanced the class from a genuine anti-fascist and anti-capitalist struggle. This analysis had two premises. The first, erroneous, was the widespread idea at the time that the Nazi movement would not withstand the test of power. 
that it would crack both because of the worker's opposition and because of its internal contradictions. But the second premise of the KPD's analysis was correct. The will to fight Hitlerism was totally lacking in social democracy. The SPD's legalism led it to fight the communists rather than the Nazis. It was a socialist police prefect, Zorgibel, who on May 1, 1929, opened fire on the communist procession in Berlin, killing 33 demonstrators. It was the Prussian socialist interior minister, Severing, who then had the rote front Kampferbund banned. The following year, the socialists allowed the adoption of the very repressive Law for the Protection of the Republic. The communist mayors were no longer confirmed in office, and the police closed the KPD headquarters. The SPD voted for Article 48, which would give full powers to Hitler, and was the main architect of the re-election in 1932 of Marshal Hindenburg, who would choose Hitler as chancellor a few months later. The same policy was followed in the large ADGB trade union, where the social democratic leadership proceeded with massive exclusions of communists. On July 17, 1932 in Altona, a working-class district of Hamburg, the machine gunners of the police force led by the social democrat Eggerstadt came to the rescue of a Nazi parade threatened by communist counter-demonstrators. Seventeen counter-demonstrators were killed. These facts gave particular weight to Stalin's 1924 analysis that, quote, social democracy is objectively the moderate wing of fascism. These organizations do not negate, but supplement each other, unquote. In summary, the KPD leadership rejected the idea of fighting exclusively against the Nazis and considered the idea of a, quote, top-down, unquote, alliance between the KPD and the SPD to be a right-wing deviation. The KPD line thus envisaged a two-front struggle, constantly revolving around a central principle, that of the, quote, united front at the base, unquote. This principle consisted of allying itself with the social democratic workers in the factories and neighborhoods, while fighting against the social democratic leadership and organizations, it was a difficult exercise. The KPD could do or not do anything. It served, quote, objectively, unquote, either the social democrats or the Nazis. The latter represented the blackest of reactions. But the SPD was infinitely more powerful, and above all, it was in power. It was the manager of German capitalism. Issues such as whether to participate in a Nazi-inspired referendum against the SPD government of the Prussian state, which were easy to decide after the event, were such complex and high-stakes problems at the time that they gave rise to terrible conflicts at the head of the party. In January 1933, the Nazis came to power. The communists reacted in several large cities with strikes and savagely repressed demonstrations. In February, the police invaded the headquarters of the KPD, the Karl Liebknecht House, and outlawed the party. On the night of February 27 through 28 alone, after the burning of the Reichstag, 10,000 communists were arrested, including the main members of the Central Committee and two-thirds of the middle cadres. A few weeks later, there were 20,000. 60 camps, 30 special quarters in state prisons, and 60 detention centers were open to accommodate them. In each neighborhood, in each locality, the little Nazi chiefs set up their private prisons and torture centers in cellars or empty factories. The chaos and abuses were such, 500 to 600 people shot or tortured to death, families upended, civil servants refused to participate in the parish priest's work, themselves sequestered, beaten and humiliated, etc., that they become the stakes in the struggle for influence among the Nazis. In April, the SA were ordered to hand over their prisoners to the SS, which was developing a network of concentration camps throughout Germany on the Dachau model. Terror was applied methodically and rationally. In June, the SS introduced the practice, which was to become systematic, of hanging rebel prisoners on the roll call square in front of the camp population, standing at attention. The first victim was the communist worker Emil Bargatsky. In spite of the waves of arrest, Ernst Tallmann, KPD's general secretary, was arrested on March 3rd in Berlin in a clandestine party apartment. The communists continued to openly confront the SA, which had the status of auxiliary police. The Gazette de Lausanne of March 2nd wrote, quote, Only the communists resist. Obviously the struggle is not equal. They have all the forces of the state against them. But, for the lack of numbers, they have ardor, fanaticism, they fought for the street, unquote. In one month, according to official statistics, there were 62 deaths in street battles, including 29 communists, 14 Nazis, and 8 socialists. 
These figures are much lower than the reality. One only has to read the pages that Richard Krebs, under the pseudonym Jan Valton, devoted to the street battles in Hamburg to realize the incredible violence of the confrontations. As it became clear every day that the KPD would have the underbelly, the party prepared for a long period of clandestinity. It was at this point that many experienced, as well as little-known activists, were instructed to pretend to join the Nazi party, NSDAP, in order to carry out undermining and intelligence work. When the Nazis came to power, the SPD continued to validate the KPD's analysis, preferring conciliation to confrontation. The Socialists refused to participate in the anti-Hitler general strike in the aftermath of the Reichstag coup. This was a critical decision, because the proletariat believed that the general strike could defeat the Nazi coup de force, just as it had defeated the Cap Putsch in March 1920. Goebbels' diary shows that the Nazis feared this general strike more than anything else. The first meeting of Hitler's cabinet was entirely devoted to this eventuality. The SPD had been powerless to prevent the right-wing deputies from granting Hitler the benefit of Article 48. The elected representatives of the SPD and the KPD together would have reached the required quorum, but the communist representatives were hunted down, arrested, and tortured on the basis of police lists drawn up by the SPD prefects, while the SPD representatives continued the parliamentary routine. In order to avoid the Nazi criticism of being a, quote, party from abroad, unquote, the SPD left the Socialist International and even approved the Nazi foreign policy program in May 1933. While several social democratic leaders went into camps or exile, many others collaborated or remained in the Reich without further concern. Minister Severing, for example, withdrew from business but remained in Germany, receiving his pension under the new regime. This was also the case with Noski, the socialist leader who had led the crushing of the Spartacus and the massacre of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. The social democratic leadership in Württemberg decided to dissolve itself by calling on the SPD municipalities to, quote, support the new order in the national revolution, unquote. When the Berlin section of the young socialist workers organized clandestine work and protected the organization's money from the Nazis, its leader demanded an end to, quote, these small illegal schemes, unquote. In the Berlin-Bradenburg district, sections of the SPD's order service, the Reichsbanner, which had 160,000 militiamen, received this circular. We are left with three possibilities, the use of violent methods of the communist, but it is clear to every one of our comrades that these methods are criminal and must be left aside, abstention, the search for collaboration within the framework of practical life. For years we have carried in our hearts faith in Germany and in the future of Germany. That is why we will claim our place in the new life of the German state and do for Germany what it expects of us, our duty. The executive committee negotiates with the competent authorities about the activity of our association. The following points are fundamental. Culture of friendship, assistance to veterans, youth education, military preparation, voluntary work service. All the testimonies attest to both the communist resistance and to the social democratic debacle. From press articles, quote, the attitude of the communists in front of bloody and implacable judges was so exemplary that one had the impression that they alone had been given the mandate to maintain the resistance, unquote. Two Secret Service reports, quote, first of all, let us note that no communist party leader bowed to the national revolution. All of them are in prison, on the run, or in hiding. It is mainly communists who have gone to populate the concentration camps. Others have gone abroad. The need for the leaders who have remained at their posts to hide and work clandestinely reduces their action to very little, and it is even doubtful that their work can be prolonged for long in the presence of searches by a police force developed to the extreme. If the communists, who, it must be repeated, showed an indisputable nerve until last March, are at this point, it is easy to imagine how far the socialists have gone. They have only known how to bow or flee, like Braun, Rosinski, Breitscheid, Dittmann, Crisprain, Noski, Bergman, unless they bring to the new regime a more or less veiled adherence like Leipart, Grassmann, Tarnow, Wells, Stamfer, Hilferding. Unquote. The Social Democratic Union leadership also gave in very quickly to the Nazis. Its president wrote to Hitler to inform him that the ADGB had broken with the SPD. On March 20th, the ADGB published a damning manifesto. Quote, the trade union organizations are the expression of an irrefutable social necessity, an indispensable part of the social order itself. 
According to the natural order of things, they have become more and more integrated into the state. The social function of the trade unions must be fulfilled, whatever the nature of the regime of the state. The trade union organizations do not claim to directly influence state policy. Their task in this sense can only be to place at the disposal of the government and parliament the knowledge and experience they have acquired in this field." Unquote. On April 22, 1933, the ADGB announced it was leaving the International Federation of Trade Unions. The ADGB undertook to unite with the National Socialist Factory Cell Organization, NSBO, to form a single trade union and participated on Nazi commemoration of May 1st. But these capitulations did not save it from the ban. The NSDAP remained in a minority in the March 1933 elections, but it enjoyed the support of the right-wing parties in Parliament to grant Hitler the full powers provided for in Article 48. Repression gradually extended to trade unionists. The SA occupied the trade union building on May 2, 1933, and arrests began the next day. The Social Democrats, the SPD, disbanded on June 22, 1933, and Christians opposed to Nazi warmongering and racism. By July 1933, tens of thousands of people had been interned and there were 27,000 political prisoners in the concentration camps. In November, 60,000 communist militants were arrested and 2,000 murdered. Trials were held in a chain reaction. On May 23rd, two communist activists were the first to be sentenced to death by the new regime. Nazi repression left activists who had been unable or unwilling to leave Germany with the choice between three mindsets. Some, discouraged by the terrible defeat of the communist movement, deprived of leadership, and intimidated by state terror, abandoned the struggle. Among them were a handful of leaders, because not all of them were up to the dizzying height of events. At the end of April 1933, for example, the Arbiter Zeitung, an organ of the KPD in Saarland, the German regime occupied by France from 1919 to 1935, published this opinion. Quote, the district of the KPD, Baden-Palatinate, asked us to publish the following exclusion. The deputy to the Reichstag, Bendem Kusel, has been living in Saarland for several weeks and who had received orders from the district to return to Germany, did not respond to this invitation. He was expelled from the German Communist Party for cowardice in the face of the class enemy, unquote. A small number of KPD members collaborated with the regime, simple grassroots activists and most often new party members but tens of thousands of communists adopted a position of resistance. Often there was a long way from this position to organized and effective clandestine action. Party structures crumbled, cadres were imprisoned or exiled, sympathizers were watched, but clandestine party organizations were reconstituted very quickly to be generally just as quickly dismantled and rebuilt again. Chapter 2, In Exile, In Spain if half of the KPD leaders had been arrested and imprisoned in February through March of 1933, several dozen leaders and several thousand militants and middle-ranking cadres had been able to escape the roundups and go abroad. France took in the largest number of German political refugees, 30,000 in the summer of 1933. It was in France that the external leadership of the party settled in mid-May 1933, followed in 1936 by its reconstituted political bureau. Some worked there in semi-clandestinity, such as Wilhelm Pieck, Wilhelm Florin, or Franz Dahlem. Others openly and successfully organized anti-fascist propaganda for capitalist Europe, such as former KPD deputies Paul Schwenk and Willy Munzenberg. The latter was also secretary of the International Red Aid, the common turn organization that organized solidarity with political prisoners. Helping anti-Hitler political refugees was the largest campaign of the International Red Aid, since the Sacco von Zetti affair. The most important campaigns were the Leipzig trial against Dimitrov, accused of burning the Reichstag, the campaign demanding the release of Tallman, and the campaign denouncing the death of Albert Funk. Albert Funk had succeeded in reconstituting the KPD organization in Dortmund, which the Gestapo had dismantled at the end of March by arresting nearly 300 communist militants in the city. Funk was in turn arrested on April 16, 1933, he was tortured for 10 days without betraying anything and finally, fearing that he could not take any more, took advantage of the executioner's distractions to throw himself out of an 18-meter high window. A few weeks later, the Ruhr area was flooded with thousands of KPD leaflets with Funk's photo, and his case was highlighted in anti-Hitler campaigns abroad. 
The Tallman Committee, founded in Paris in March 1934, published in its first year of activity 20,000 brochures, 10,000 sheets of the Tallman song, 30,000 badges, 32,000 postcards, three publications with a total print run of 150,000 copies, 260,000 leaflets, 15,600 posters, etc. The Tallman Committee also put out a number of other publications. In addition, it organized a large number of meetings, gathering more than 100,000 people in 1935 alone, released hundreds of balloons over Germany on which was written Freiheit für Tallman, sent delegations, organized a counter-court with 300 jurists, etc. The Nazis announced his trial publicly several times, but their propaganda suffered a terrible fiasco at the Leipzig trial. In this trial, which had remained a model of its kind, the accused had become an accuser. In front of the international press, Dimitrov succeeded in dismantling the Nazi machinations and unmasking Goring, who had come to testify in court. Tallman's inflexible resistance left the Nazis fearing a new Leipzig, and they abandoned their plan for a show trial. Escape routes were set up, and the KPD organized large and effective underground operations in Belgium, France, Holland, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, and Luxembourg. These centers sent delegates to reconstitute party organizations and to provide these organizations with the means of political work, leaflets, brochures, and especially in the form of Tarnschriften, i.e. publications, with an innocuous or fake cover. The Belgian Center, for example, had one of the editions of the KPD organ, the Rote Fawn, printed in Brussels and used the sea channels between Antwerp and Germany to infiltrate delegates and material into the Reich. This was a relentless and extremely costly activity for cadres, because the repression did not weaken and hundreds of delegates fell into Gestapo traps. A few months after the big roundup, the party had already managed to break out dozens of imprisoned activists. Thus, on May 9, 1933, it brought a file for sawing through bars and planks for crossing the barbed wire into the cell of KPD Deputy Hans Beimler, in the death row block at Dachau. Beimler was taken by an exfiltration line and went to France. The communist escapees brought the first information about the Nazi camps to the West very early on. For example, the testimony of Egon Irwin, published in L'Humanité on March 23, 1933. It was the KPD militants in exile who also constituted the first international anti-fascist unit in Spain, the Centuria or Column, Tallman, the German battalion Edgar André of the 11th Brigade, was the first international unit to be committed to the front. In October 1936, this battalion took the name of a KPD M apparat leader who had been imprisoned and tortured since 1933. Within a few days, the battalion lost a third of its men in Madrid, and two weeks later, on November 4, 1936, Edgar André was beheaded in Berlin. The German Tallman Battalion, commanded by the communist writer Ludwig Wren, formed the solid core of the 12th Brigade, which was engaged a few days later, first at the Cerro de Los Angeles, then in the university campus of Madrid. The political commissioner of the brigade was the communist writer Gustav Regler. There was also the escaped deputy Hans Beimler, who became both political commissioner of the Tallman Battalion and general political commissioner for all the Germans fighting in Spain. He was killed in action in Madrid in December 1936 and replaced by Franz Dahlem, another KPD deputy. Wilhelm Zeisser, a leader of the M apparat who had studied at the Moscow Military Academy, commanded the 13th Brigade under the pseudonym General Gomez. A total of 5,000 Germans fought in the international brigades. Among them were 1,700 or 1,800 members of the KPD, 1,000 members of the small leftist parties SAP and KPDO, and 700 or 800 members of the SPD. 2,000 of them were killed. These figures, which only concern the international brigades, do not do justice to the commitment of the German communists in Spain. They were numerous in the network supplying arms to the Republic and sabotaging weapons intended for the fascists and the security services, the Spanish SIM and the Soviet NKVD. Agitators achieved remarkable results in their work, with the crews of the German merchant navy at the risk and sometimes at the cost of their lives. The crews of six ships, the Henrika, the Koningstein, the Malila, the Lazbek, the Poseidon, and the Priusen refused outright to transport arms shipments to Franco's ports. The German communists were also active in the corps of the partisans of the People's Army. This corps infiltrated commandos behind fascist lines for occasional sabotage and intelligence operations, 
Soviet advisor Balchasov, sent an instructor to the partisans, spoke in his memoirs of a commando unit composed exclusively of German communists, led by a steelworker who had survived the Gestapo raids. In a single mission at the beginning of December 1937, this group, led by a local Spaniard, blew up six trucks loaded with troops on the Huesca Jaca Road, killed many fascists, and brought back prisoners and documents. In addition to all these commitments, there was the political work carried out within the Reich on the Spanish question. Clandestine collections for Spain were organized as early as 1936 in Bavaria, Silesia, and the Rhineland. 1,500 Germans left the Reich during the Spanish Civil War to fight fascism in Spain. The Gestapo arrested and deported 3,000 Germans, communists and socialists, for hostile demonstrations and sent the Condor Legion to Franco's side. In January 1937, a KPD shortwave broadcasting station was heard throughout the Third Reich. It was designated by its wavelength, 29.8. Its broadcast announced the degradation of the working class, corruption, warmongering, anti-Semitism, and intervention in Spain, denounced by name the Gestapo snitches, reported on the struggles, and broadcast the declarations of prestigious anti-fascists. This station acquired a level of popularity that was reported by a Norwegian government newspaper correspondent, quote, all over Germany, in workshops, stores, liquor stores, and large buildings. The mysterious figure of 29.8 is now being talked about. This figure can be read on walls and fences. On the walls of houses, it is written in chalk, and people look at each other when they find this curious decimal fraction. You blink your eyes and you understand each other. Although it is the Communist Party's position, it deliberately avoids everything that comes out of narrow party politics. Thus, the post becomes the mouthpiece of the German opposition, unquote. Thus, Priest and Cologne shorthanded Heinrich Mann's speech on 29.8 and distributed it to their parishioners. The content of a 29.8 program about Tallman was reproduced in the form of leaflets in Berlin factories. The Gestapo undertook an audit of listeners, identifying the owners of radios capable of receiving shortwave, and the press announced several arrests for listening to 29.8. The Nazis installed a powerful transmitter in East Prussia to jam the broadcasts. But the radio started broadcasting slightly below or above 29.8, and it was still possible to hear it. Eventually, the Nazis had to install three more transmitters to jam the KPD's clandestine broadcasts. The KPD's organization abroad suffered a blow in September 1939. Following the declaration of war, the French police intercepted all German and Austrian citizens, 18,000 people, the vast majority Jewish and anti-fascist refugees. The main leaders of the KPD were locked up, including Franz Dahlem, Paul Merker, George Stiebe, and Adolf Dieter. The KPD leadership was reconstituted again in 1939, this time in Moscow, by Wilhelm Pieck and Walter Ulbricht, but the party was still in the process of reorganization when Hitler's blitzkrieg struck Western Europe. Chapter 3, KPD Clandestine Organizations in Germany A police report from Weisbaden in 1935 noted that, quote, It is confirmed that the Communist Party has a staff of collaborators endowed with remarkable organizational and tactical abilities, who, despite the most rigorous surveillance, have recreated illegal organizations in some regions with some success, unquote. As early as March 1933, the communist press reappeared clandestinely in Germany and abroad. Das Ruhr Echo, Die Hamburger Volkszeitung, and Die Rote Fauna were printed in tens of thousands of copies, while the Roter Jungstrom distributed 20,000 brochures in Saxony alone. When Daniel Guerin visited the working class districts of Hamburg and Altona in May 1933, networks distributed the party press there, and one could see, freshly painted on the walls and sidewalks, quote, Long live communism, unquote, quote, Hitler should die, unquote, and quote, long live the revolution, unquote. In 1934, the Gestapo noted in its reports that despite the arrests and sentences imposed on the communists, quote, there are still people who engage in clandestine work, unquote, and that, quote, the KPD has an enormous apparatus of remarkable permanent staff who succeed in the provinces in reconstituting the party apparatus, unquote. In that year, 10,000 to 12,000 copies of the Rote Fane came out three times a month from an underground printing house in Solingen. But rebuilding the party was a long and costly process, and often, as we have said, a local or regional organization that had barely been rebuilt was dismantled by the Gestapo with an upsurge of brutality and efficiency. In October 1935, according to Wilhelm Pieck, 
Out of the 422 leaders of January 1933, 219 were imprisoned, 24 were executed, 125 emigrated, including Peake himself, who at the time headed the KPD center in Prague. 41 left the party, and 13 led the resistance within the Reich. In 1936, the Gestapo arrested 11,678 communists, among them Wilhelm Furl, who coordinated the party's activity inside the country. At the same time, the police arrested 1,374 socialists. The Gestapo archives reveal that its agents seized 1,643,200 communist newspapers, leaflets, and brochures that year. And this is only the material seized. The quantity of material produced was naturally even greater. The regime was particularly sensitive to revelations about the corruption of Nazi leaders, quote, who make acknowledged a 1935 Berlin Gestapo report, communist writings much more interesting to readers than the legal press, unquote. In Dortmund, for example, where August Stotzel and Wilhelm Sand had replaced Albert Funk, the local KPD organization distributed two newspapers printed abroad and smuggled into the Reich, and two newspapers printed locally. The Stotzel Sand organization was dismantled in January 1934 with more than 200 arrests. In 1935, the organization was reconstituted for the third time, and the communist underground press once again circulated in the city. To show that the whole of Germany was not behind Hitler, the KPD planned a campaign of unrest and strikes for the 1936 Berlin Olympics. The Gestapo was expecting this offensive, as a report found in its archive indicates, quote, Since there is still a strong illegal KPD organization in Berlin, the Communist Central Office will try to provide the various subordinate organizations with suitable propaganda material and effective slogans, unquote. The Gestapo therefore carried out roundups, particularly targeting workers who had been members of the KPD sports organizations. Despite these preventative measures, the testimonies of foreign tourists and police reports describe numerous incidents, Nazi flags torn and burned, communist slogans chanted in the crowd or painted on the walls, distribution of leaflets, strikes in the workplaces. Thus, the communists put the large automobile factory Auto Union in Berlin on strike. Concerned about its Olympic propaganda, the regime granted the strikers a wage increase, but repression then fell on them. From 1933 to 1939, one million Germans were apprehended, and 275,000 sentenced to 600,000 total years in prison for anti-fascist activity. There were between 150,000 and 300,000 Germans permanently in concentration camps, not counting those detained for racist reasons. In 1939, for example, there were 112,000 people in prison, after a political conviction, 27,000, quote, politicians, unquote, awaiting trial, and another 160,000 locked up without trial in the concentration camps. Repression became more radical. The first official execution of a woman took place in 1938. She was Lysolette Hermann, a communist student from Stuttgart, mother of two young children. At that time, official executions of communist militants totaled 95, and extrajudicial executions several thousand. Of course, the concept of, quote, extrajudicial, unquote, did not mean much for the Third Reich, since the eminent Nazi jurist Theodor Manz, professor of public law in Freiburg, had given this definition of the law, quote, the law is the plan formed by the Fuhrer, and thus the expression of the order of life of the German race. The plan formed by the Fuhrer is the supreme law of law, unquote. But the work of reconstruction did not cease, and in 1939 the KPD counted 3,000 active and organized clandestine workers within the Reich, supported by thousands of sympathizers and accomplices. The reports found in the Gestapo archives bear witness to this. Quote, Communist activity is carried out, as we have noted on several occasions, in the companies. The observations made previously on communist activity in places where large masses of workers are gathered, car sites and temporary Volkswagen factories, are currently of interest to the West Wall sites, and on the one hand, to the mines, unquote. The Berlin KPD organization led by Willy Gall was dismantled by the Gestapo in January 1940. Willy Gall was executed on July 25, 1941. It was rebuilt by Rudolf Hollemeyer, and in 1941, Dairo Fane, the party organ, clandestinely reappeared in Berlin. This new organization was in turn dismantled after two years of intense activity, 
its leaders were executed shortly after their arrest. Holmeyer himself, but also Heinz Kappel, Eric Ziegler, Robert Urig, and other group and network leaders. A new organization was then reconstituted by Wilhelm Noken and Alfred Kowalk, which was dismantled in January 1943. In practice, the subversive work never ceased. In 1942, during the Great Anti-Communist Exhibition, quote, Soviet Paradise, unquote, at the Luce Garden in Berlin, teams of poster painters under armed protection covered the city walls with this answer, quote, Nazi paradise, war, hunger, lies, Gestapo, for how much longer, unquote. Parallel to this initiative, a group of young Jewish communist workers at Siemens, led by Herbert Baum, exploded two incendiary devices in the exhibition pavilion, which the Berlin Fire Department managed to save in extremis. This group had existed as early as 1933 and had resisted two waves of arrests in 1935 and 1938 before organizing a hundred resistance fighters in 1941. After its dismantling, 22 members of this group were beheaded. The others died in concentration camps. Also in Berlin, Wilhelm Butel, leader of the Red Aid, wrote Hilfe, who returned to Germany in 1942, reconstituted this organization to support the victims of repression. He was arrested by the Gestapo in 1943 and executed in 1944. In 1933 through 44, the Berlin KPD organization benefited from the exceptional militant qualities of Anton Seifkow. Seifkow was the former leader of the KPD in Dresden and later in the Ruhr. He had been arrested in 1933 and severely tortured. After 10 years in a concentration camp, he escaped and resumed the underground struggle. In the summer of 1944, the Safecow organization in Berlin was running clandestine cells in 30 companies, including the largest war factories, Osram, Telefunken, AEG, Hasun Reed, Argus Motorin, Siemens, etc. In the summer of 1944, the Safecow organization ran clandestine cells in Berlin, it was in contact with several circles of the social democratic and bourgeois anti-fascist opposition, but also with groups of war prisoners, especially Soviet, put to work in with the clandestine organization of communist prisoners in the Sachsenhausen camp. Qualified militants printed leaflets and posters, provided liaison, stored weapons and ammunition, carried out counter-espionage and sabotage war production. There were several clandestine KPD organizations in the Ruhr, notably the one led by Franz Zylasko. This miner from the Ruhr was parachuted into the Reich by the Soviet Air Force. On his return to his region, he renewed his old contacts and rebuilt a KPD organization, camouflaged behind a cycling sports union, which the Gestapo dismantled in 1943. The Bielfeld organization was taken over by Otto Geismann. After his liberation in January 1936, he was arrested after the Reichstag fire. Particularly active in the important Der Kope arms factories, it was dismantled in 1942, 12 executions. In 1941, the communist resistance in the Ruhr was reorganized by Wilhelm Nockel. A former member of the Central Committee, he headed the KPD headquarters in Amsterdam before returning to Germany with five cadres specialized in clandestine struggle. He was arrested by the Gestapo in 1943 with 200 militants of his organization and executed in 1944 with about 50 of his comrades. In Mannheim, the organization led by George Leichleiter led an act of resistance for years until it was dismantled at the end of 1942. George Leicester and 30 members of his organization were executed. It was also in 1942 that the Gestapo dismantled the communist organization in Duisburg. About 100 militants were arrested and several were executed. Among them, Louis Reich, Willie Sang, Anton Stoop, Albert Kamrat, Frederick Kamleiter, Ferdinand Johnny, Paul Wodzniski, etc. But despite the repression in the Ruhr as in Berlin, the resistance never ceased. Other organizations were active in Hamburg, Bavaria, Hanover, Breslau, Roklaw, Konigsberg, Schleswig Holstein, etc. By 1939, the KPD was able to rebuild two large underground organizations in Thuringia. One was led by Theodor Neubauer, a former communist member of the Reichstag, and the other by Magnus Poser, a carpenter working for Zeiss in Jena. In 1943, the two organizations united and expanded to form a large organization 
that carried out its work among five main lines. Anti-fascist propaganda directed towards the German proletariat, sabotage of war production, solidarity with the anti-fascist imprisoned in Buchenwald, organizational development in companies, and contacts with deported foreign workers and prisoners of war. As a practical application of this last alliance, an international anti-fascist committee was formed in Leipzig, which united German workers with the deported Soviet workers. The leader of the latter was Nikolai Rumiantsev, a communist miner from the Don Basin. The KPD delegate was Max Hauck. This committee prepared the liberation of the Soviet prisoners of war and their organization into battle groups as part of a general insurrection plan. Rumiinstev and Hauk were arrested and executed in 1944. The clandestine communist organization of Hamburg, active in 30 factories and shipyards, was led from 1941 to 42 by Bernhard Basslein, a former KPD deputy, Oskar Reinke, and Franz Jacob, who had just been liberated from a concentration camp. Arrested again by the Gestapo in 1943, they were able to take advantage of the destruction of the prison by an Allied bombardment to escape. Arrested a third time in 1944, they were executed with about 60 members of their organization after terrible torture. In Saxony, the clandestine organization was led by George Schumann, an old fellow fighter of Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. It was a powerful organization that had clandestine groups in 17 companies in several localities. The Schumann organization linked up with other clandestine KPD organizations in central Germany, such as the organization led by Otto Koenig, active in the Mansfeld mines, and the giant Luna Work and Buna Work factories. Several clandestine KPD organizations opened up to non-communists. The organization led by Robert Havman and George Grossgerth, which helped prisoners, escapees, and Jews by printing food cards, and Werner Scharf's organization, which also helped Jews. The KPD leadership in Moscow decided to regroup all these organizations, which in 1944 had 10,000 active underground workers in about 100 cities, and to strengthen ties with non-communist anti-fascists. In the spring of 1944, SafeCow organized a conference in Engelsdorf, which was attended by delegates from all the clandestine anti-fascist groups in the Leipzig region. The document developed at this conference was taken over by the Central Committee of the KPD, and became the party's program text. It was widely distributed in the Reich, including as a leaflet on May 1, 1944. It endorsed an already perceptible change of line, which advocated an anti-fascist front for the construction of a German democratic republic, rather than pursuing a, quote, class against class, unquote, policy for the construction of a German Soviet republic. The impact of communist subversive labor on war production is certain. Apart from direct sabotage, for example, the communist cell at Hassog Work Factory replaced the explosive charge of the Panzerfaust anti-tank rocket launchers with sand. The effect of leaflets calling for bad and slow work to hasten the end of the war is difficult to measure. But the productivity of the war factories was everywhere lower than the calculations of the Nazi engineers. Calls for strikes were increasingly widely heeded. The Nazi Minister of Justice acknowledged, in a newspaper intended for a restricted high circle of high-ranking civil servants, that in the first half of 1944 there had been 200,000 strikers of all nationalities in Germany. And this in a climate of unheard of terror. The Nazi police had arrested 177,000 men and women inside the Reich during the same six-month period. At that time, an estimated 125,000 German workers were linked to the anti-fascist resistance. As the Reich had to devote more and more resources to its internal security, the 40,000 Gestapo agents in charge of the fight against the resistance were no longer sufficient. 30 new SS police battalions were formed, as well as detachments of armed Nazi militants. The KPD still suffered numerous blows in Germany, particularly in autumn 1944, when Safecow was arrested along with other leaders and 300 militants. Safecow was executed along with 71 members of his organization. Three detainees had already died under torture. Three others had been gassed as Jews. The verdict of September 5, 1944 said in particular, quote, Safecow, Jacob, Bastlein are old permanent communist officials. Deeply animated by an unbounded hatred against our fear and our state, and they did not hide it during the hearings. They are hardened and incorrigible. 
the punishments they have already endured made no more impression on them than their stay in the concentration camps. Especially in the fifth year of the war, they were so successful in reconstituting the German Communist Party and working for the disintegration of the Wehrmacht that it resulted in the most serious perils for the Reich, unquote. About 100 members of the Safe Cow organization escaped the blow and went back to work. All over Germany, other organizations were reconstituted, such as in Rupert Hall, CAP Organization, Gotha, Bush Organization, Pomerania, M. Pocker Krauss Organization, Thuringia, Central Germany, Buchner Organization, Dresden, Cologne, Dortmund, and of course, Berlin, Fischer Organization. Chapter 4, KPD in Occupied Countries While the Social Democratic leaders Otto Bauer and Friedrich Adler spoke of, quote, historical necessity, unquote, in connection with the Third Reich's annexation of Austria, the KPD clearly denounced the Anschluss. Quote, the German working class, the German people, repel Hitler's monstrous act against Austria with all of their might. The workers and the German people want nothing to do with this oppression of the Austrian people, unquote. Moreover, at its 14th Congress, held at Gervais near Juvusy on January 30th and February 1st, 1939, to bewilder the Gestapo, it was referred to as, quote, the Bern Congress, unquote. The KPD declared that, quote, if war were to break out, the German anti-fascists would side with the peoples under attack and would do everything to bring about the rapid defeat of fascism, unquote. That's what they did. Everywhere, German communists united with the resistance fighters of the occupied countries. In general, this engagement was so diluted that it might appear anecdotal if it is noticed at all. But examination reveals it to be omnipresent and systematic. The communist parties in the occupied countries organized a, quote, TA, unquote, German labor, section to make propaganda to the occupation troops. The TA was carried out by militants belonging to the KPD and or the Austrian Communist Party, KPO. And the Communist Party of the country concerned, often immigrants who knew the German language, often Jews from Central Europe. In Paris, the TA was started as early as July 1940 by two young KPD members, Sally Grumvogel and Roman Rubinstein, who put up posters on barracks walls and in places frequented by soldiers. Very quickly, they assembled a solid group of clandestine KPD who came into contact with the PCF. By 1941, the TA network of the KPD and KPO had already succeeded in forming 27 committees of soldiers and the occupation troops in France. In Belgium, the KPD appointed Hermann Geisen, a party official and former interbrigadist, as head of the TA. From May 1941 onwards, the German military police report showed that they were worried about the TA's work to demoralize occupation soldiers. In Belgium, too, this activity relied on many sacrifices, including the lives of Wilhelm Katz, Siegfried Fuhrer, and Werner Blank, who were caught distributing communist leaflets to soldiers at the Antwerp Sports Palace on January 1, 1942. They were tried and shot in Essen in 1943. Geisen was arrested at the end of 1941 and beheaded in Berlin on April 21, 1943. His successors were Max Stoy, beheaded in Berlin in May 1943, and Otto Abel, who was wounded by a revolver on August 15, 1943, while trying to escape from the SS anti-Jewish section. The SS deported him to Auschwitz as a Jew, without having learned anything about his activities in the TA. The other leaders of the TA in Belgium were Frieda Ginkberg, who was arrested and murdered in Ravensbrück, and the Austrian Gerhard Paul Herrenstadt. This work gradually gained momentum. Newspapers were created, and German and Austrian communists infiltrated the German administration under false French identities. Young activists got to know German soldiers and tried to make them understand the criminal nature of Hitler's war. This work sometimes had appreciable results, especially with Austrian or Volksdeutsch soldiers. The Volksdeutsch were members of the German minorities in Poland, the Czech Republic, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Slovenia, Vojvodina, etc., and they were mobilized as citizens of the Greater German Reich. A group of Polish Volksdeutsch of the Wehrmacht, who worked in France with the TA, provided weapons and uniforms for the Maquis and deserted their barracks. The Austrians were targeted because many of them felt unwillingly drawn into Hitler's war. The TA sometimes cleverly used legal channels. 
Thus, in 1944, anti-fascists were circulating a copy of the October 1941 edition of the Nazi newspaper, Brussler Zeitung, which an article entitled Russia Has Lost the War and the War Will Be Over in 1941 in the occupation units in Belgium. Putting this edition back into circulation in 1944, one year after the Stalingrad disaster, had a definite effect on morale. And when a Nazi tried to oppose the collective reading of this article, he was asked if he believed the Nazi newspaper was lying. Many Germans, communist militants in exile, young soldiers or workers of the Tot organization joined the Maquis. They were most numerous in the USSR, particularly in Belarus, but also in Crimea, Moldavia, Ukraine, etc. In Slovakia, where in 1944, 80,000 partisans fought under the supervision of parachuted in Soviet officers. In Greece, there were German or Greek-German partisan units in the 2nd, 3rd, and 11th divisions of the guerrilla army, founded by the Greek Communist Party, the ELAS, the National Liberation Army of Greece. And in Yugoslavia, German anti-fascist, deserters of the Wehrmacht, or members of the German national minority in Yugoslavia, formed the Talman Detachment in Tito's Yugoslav People's Liberation Army. But there were some everywhere, in Poland, Albania, Denmark, Italy, and of course in France, in the Alps, Lozère, the Cévennes, Limousine, etc. The best known of these Machiards is Leo Gerhard. This young German anti-fascist was under the leadership of Werner Schwartz, a touring worker who first worked in a clandestine KPD organization in Germany. Schwartz was an interbrigadist who escaped from a French concentration camp and later became the head of the TA in Toulouse. Schwartz sent Gerhard to infiltrate the Toulouse transport commander Danter under a false French identity. Later, Gerhard was arrested in Castres for distributing leaflets of the National Committee for a Free Germany to German soldiers. He was freed during a transfer to the military court by the attack on his train by a Maquis of Franks Tireur et Partisans, FTP communist. He himself became an FTP Maquis and participated in the hard fighting for the liberation of Toul. In France, the German Machiards fought either directly in the FTP units or in the FTP units that organized the fighters of foreign origin by nationality. The FTP MOI, immigrant labor. Some Maquis were even 100% German. This was the case of the FTP Maquis of Boncom, which was commanded in April 1943 by former KPD deputy Otto Kuhn. The German partisans engaged the SS, who wanted to attack villages in the departments of Gard and Lozère in many battles and thus save their inhabitants from fierce punitive actions. Many died in battle, and those that the German army managed to take alive were tortured to death. Their remains were found with their sexual parts mutilated, their tongues torn out, and their feet and hands deeply burned. At the end of August 1944, the French Machiards who took part in the victory challenge in Nimes decided that the German partisans would march at their head and carry the flag of victory. Even the Brussels Corps of the Belgian Partisan Army, the guerrilla organization founded by the Communist Party, had a German-Austrian company of about 20 fighters commanded by Otto Spitz. Some militants joined the urban guerrillas, and several of them, such as Leo Neller, Alfred Wozniak, or Richard Hugo, achieved real feats there. A communist militant in Berlin in the 1920s, Leo Neller was forced into exile for the first time in 1929. He returned to Germany in 1932, was arrested by the Nazis, escaped to France, fought in Spain, was locked up in a French concentration camp, escaped from there, and entered Germany once again under the identity of a volunteer foreign worker to organize a clandestine KPD group in the Ruhr. He escaped from the Gestapo when his organization was dismantled and returned to France, where he joined the FTP MOI task force in Paris, the famous Red Poster. There he commanded the Stalingrad Detachment. It is Naylor who, protected by the other fighters of the special team, on July 28, 1943, blew up the car of Lieutenant Colonel Prince Moritz von Radeber with a grenade, giving birth to the legend of the execution of General von Schaumburg, military governor of Gross Paris. Moritz von Radeber escaped the special team, but two months later, SS General Julius Ritter was shot in the middle of Paris by the same team. Ritter was in charge of the deportation of French workers to the Reich as part of the service du travail obligatoire. The Third Reich organized a state funeral for him. What Neller did not know was that the weapons of his group had been supplied to the partisan FTPs by a KPD cell active in the heart of the Kriegsmarine headquarters in Paris, 
Chief Petty Officer Hans Heisel and two sailors who joined the clandestine KPD in 1942 had stolen about 20 pistols from the changing rooms of a pool reserved for German soldiers. These weapons were handed over to the TA contact of the French resistance and ended up in the hands of Neller and his comrades. Another great German figure of urban guerrilla warfare in France was Alfred Wozniak who, disguised as an officer, placed the bomb that devastated the mess hall of the Kommandanteur in Nice. Later, disguised as a German policeman, he broke into the Gestapo office in X, stunned the platoon and left with the secret documents contained in the safe. Richard Hugo was a former German interbrigadist, member of the Mobile Corps of the Belgian Partisan Army, a shock unit directly dependent on the national staff. On July 25, 1942, with about 15 resistance fighters, he occupied the headquarters of the Association of Jews in Belgium and set fire to the files to prevent deportations. Richard Hugo was a pseudonym. He was shot shortly afterwards by Nazi police officers, and his true identity could never be established. From 1943 onwards, KPD militants in the West, and thus the thousands of Germans who had joined the French resistance, organized themselves within the framework of the National Committee for a Free Germany, which developed, as will be seen below, its own political and military structures. Chapter 5, The Special Networks, Espionage, and Sabotage Even before 1933, the KPD had sent numerous seasoned militants to the Red Army Intelligence Services, the GRU, and the Soviet Security Services, the GPU, then the NKVD. The main mission of the latter was to ensure the internal security of the USSR, but this mission involved external operations such as the liquidation of anti-Soviet exile organizations, maintaining networks in the USSR, the infiltration of the secret services of countries hostile to the USSR, etc. The services rendered to the anti-fascist cause by the German communists, linked to the Soviet secret services, were literally invaluable. Alongside well-known examples such as the Sorge Network and the harnack schultz Voisin Network, the Berlin hub of organization called by Nazi counter-espionage, the Red Orchestra. How many examples have remained in the shadows, such as that of the Brigade of the NKVD Department of Special Missions, or that of the Woolweeper organization? Richard Sorge has been described as, quote, the spy of the century, unquote, for having set up the Ramsey Network in Tokyo, which, from September 1933 to October 1941, informed the USSR precisely of Japan's political intentions and military potential. Swords thus alerted the USSR that Japan would not attack in 1941, which made it possible to send the divisions defending the Soviet Far East against the German army. This network benefited from the valuable collaboration of clandestine Japanese communist militants, but also included other German communists. Sorge himself had been a member of the KPD since its foundation in 1919. Specialized in agitprop until the first banning of the party in 1922, he was then assigned to the liaison and security apparatus. In 1924, he went to Moscow, where he adopted Soviet nationality and joined the intelligence service of the Common Turn, for which he completed several missions in Scandinavia, Germany, Great Britain, then the GRU. His first mission for the GRU was to organize a network in Shanghai in 1929 with two other German communists. In Tokyo, Sorge's radio technician was Bruno Wendt, a KPD activist trained by the GRU in Moscow, and Max Clausen, a communist sailor from Hamburg who, like Sorge, but in a different network, had worked as an intelligence officer for the GRU in Shanghai. Sorge also benefited from the collaboration of Gunther Stein, a German anti-fascist correspondent in Tokyo for an English newspaper. Arvid Harnack, a clandestine KPD activist who had worked for the GRU since 1932, was a senior official in the Reich Ministry of Economics. Harro schultz boysen was an anti-fascist officer recruited by Harnack, who worked at the Luftwaffe headquarters. The harnack schultz boysen network numbered about 100 people. The network was so integrated into the, quote, All Berlin, unquote, that it was able to provide the GRU with information of the highest importance for many years. Technical information on weapons, schedules and plans of offensive, Hitler's army orders of battles, etc. One of its members, Horst Heilmann, a communist youth activist who had pretended to go over to the Nazis, even worked in the decryption service of the Abwehr, the secret service of the German army. Quote, this network cost Germany the lives of 200,000 soldiers, unquote wrote the head of the Abwehr, Admiral Canaris, while an SS report dated December 22, 1942, stated that, 
Quote, the danger of this group is proved by the fact that it had agents in the ministries of error, economics, propaganda, and foreign affairs, the Supreme Command, the Naval Staff, the University of Berlin, the Political Racial Office, the Berlin City Administration, and the National Labor Defense Service. The arrested persons were ready to help, by all means at their disposal, the Soviet Union in its struggle against Germany, unquote. The information from the network was so valuable to the GRU that the Soviet Air Force dropped five German communists, who had been trained as radio technicians to facilitate communications with Moscow, into the middle of the Reich between October 1941 and July 1942. The Gestapo arrested 126 members of the network. 49 were tortured, sentenced to death, and hung from butcher's hooks, including Harnack, Schultz Boysen, and Haleman. Five died under torture during interrogations, burns, arms and legs crushed in vices. Two committed suicide, including John Sieg, a former editor of the Rote Fane, who wrote the network's bulletin The Home Front, and nearly 80 were sent to concentration camps where 40 died. Many German communists exiled in the USSR were part of the NKVD Special Missions Department Brigade, which brought together 20,000 elite fighters, men and women, Soviet and foreign. As a measure of the degree of confidence in this international brigade, it was entrusted with the defense of the Kremlin when Hitler's armies arrived at the edge of Moscow. Eric Woolweaver was one of the sailors whose mutiny was the spark of the German Revolution of 1918. He was the military leader of the communist uprising of May 1923 in Bochum, and then in charge of the, quote, West Bureau, unquote, in the common turn. He headed the clandestine apparatus of the International Siemens and Dockers International, founded in 1930 in Hamburg by the Profintern, the Red Trade Union International. Established in 22 countries and 19 colonies, the ISH was led by Albert Walter, who was arrested the night the Reichstag was burned down and assassinated by the Nazis. The Woolweaver organization carried out sabotage before and during the war, either on goods transported by Axis ships or on the ships themselves. One of the techniques used consisted of mixing a block of explosives, which had the appearance of coal, with the fuel. On the open sea, it was thrown into the boiler and exploded there, cutting the ship in two. The Woolweaver organization sent many German, Italian, Japanese, and Polish ships to the bottom of the ocean in this way. It should be remembered that Poland in the 1930s was a fascist dictatorship allied to Hitler. Hitler gave it his share of Czechoslovakia, the 1,700 kilometers of the Teschen region. That is why in 1938 the Bergen, Norway group of the Woolweaver organization sank, among others, the Polish cargo ship Stefan Batory, with its cargo of strategic materials destined for Franco in the North Sea. During the trial of the Copenhagen group in July 1941, the court accused Woolweaver's saboteurs of having blown up 16 German, 3 Italian, and 2 Japanese ships. The hundreds of German soldiers drowned in the sinking of a troop transport sailing from Denmark to Norway were allegedly the victims of Woolweaver's saboteurs. The organization was mainly based in Germany, Scandinavia, Dunkirk, Le Havre, Rotterdam, and Antwerp. The Woolweaver organization's Antwerp group sank the Italian freighter Boccaccio in November 1937, and in June 1938 set fire to the Japanese freighter Kasji Maru, which was on its way to Franco, Spain. When the Nazis invaded Belgium, it was the files of the Belgian police that allowed the Gestapo to arrest, torture, and murder Antwerp dockers of the Woolweaver organization. The Belgian police transmitted its information to the Gestapo before the war within the framework of Interpol, from 1938 to 1945, SS generals presided over Interpol. The Commissioner General of the Belgium Judicial Police, responsible for this collaboration, Florent Lewage, was the Belgian delegate at the Interpol headquarters in Berlin during the war, and after the war, president of Interpol. From 1933 onwards, it was often through the sailors, dockers, and boatmen of the Woolweaver organization that the KPD ensured its links with its organizations in Germany, and it was this organization that succeeded in the feat of removing all the archives of the Comintern from the Reich. The organization also had a network of informers in Swedish ports who communicated the movements of German ships, coming to load iron ore, and precious SKF ball bearings by radio to the Soviet Navy. This supply was vital for the Reich, and was the privileged target of the Soviet submarines for ambush offshore. More than 30 German transports were thus sunk. Erich Woolweber was arrested in Sweden. His extradition was immediately requested by the Nazis, but he declared that he had acquired Soviet citizenship, 
which was confirmed by Alexander Kollontai, ambassador of the USSR in Stockholm. Wolweber was deported to the USSR a few months later. These lines give only an imperfect idea of the role of German communists in Soviet and Comintern secret organizations. The history of several of these organizations remains to be written, as their members kept their involvement secret and continued to operate after the victory over Hitler within the framework of the Cold War. This was the case of the Hamburg branch and the Czechoslovak branch of the Harnock Scholos Boysen network, which escaped the Gestapo until the end and were reactivated after the war by the GRU. This was also the case for whole sections of the Woolweaver organization, and thus Kurt Weissel, a former assistant to Woolweaver, played an important role in the network formed by William Fisher, alias Rudolf Abel, in the U.S. In 1949 through 1950, Whistle set up a dormant network of dockers on the east coast of the U.S. who would carry out sabotage in the event of war against the USSR. Chapter 6, The National Committee for a Free Germany On June 10, 1941, a mobilized German communist, Rudolf Richter, joined the Soviet outposts and warned them of an imminent attack by Hitler's troop against the USSR. On the evening of June 21st, soldier Alfred Liskow swam across the Bug River and gave the Soviets new details. The attack was the next day. During the night, NCO Wilhelm Schutz deserted his regiment in which the invasion order had just been read. Wounded by German sentries, he was picked up by Soviet soldiers and half unconscious, he told them, quote, I am a communist. In an hour, it will be war. They will attack you. Be careful, comrades, unquote. In the days that followed, several mobilized communists took advantage of the war against the Soviet Union to desert and join the Red Army. Making this choice at a time when the German army was going from victory to victory could only be made by staunch communists. On the proposal of Dimitrov, who had become Secretary General of the Comintern, a statement made by 158 German prisoners was broadcast by Radio Moscow and dropped in the form of a leaflet over the Hitler lines. It was a new step towards the foundation in Krasnogorsk in July 1943 of the National Committee for a Free Germany. Its program was to fight for the end of the war, with Germany renouncing all conquered territories, for a formation of a democratic republic, and for the judgment of the Hitlerians. When it was founded, the committee was led by 13 communist exiles, eight KPD cadres, including Wilhelm Pieck and Walter Ubricht, and five intellectuals, and 25 anti-fascist Wehrmacht soldiers who had been captured by the Red Army. Delegates of the National Committee for a Free Germany gave lectures in the prison camps, and as rallies led to further rallies, the committee grew rapidly. From Stalingrad, the movement became massive, rallying thousands of soldiers, hundreds of officers, 63 generals, and even the Field Marshal von Paulus, who had surrendered at Stalingrad despite Hitler's order to fight to the last soldier. The committee engaged massively to precipitate the disintegration of Hitler's armies. By 1944, 1,500 delegates of the committee who had received general ideological training at the Krasnogorsk anti-fascist school were on the front. Using loudspeakers, they called on the soldiers to end the war. Information about the unit to, quote, work on, unquote, was collected in advance. A delegate from the recruiting area was sent to the unit, and the delegate addressed the soldiers in the regional dialect, etc. The results of this activity were disappointing, with a few exceptions, such as the surrender on July 8, 1944, of the commander and many soldiers of the 12th Corps, dispersed in the vicinity of Minsk. Sometimes members of the committee, such as Heinz Kessler, who later became Deputy Minister of Defense of the GDR, even infiltrated German lines or parachuted behind them. One of them, Hans Jahn, disguised as an officer, one day took command of a company cut off from his regiment and led it to the Soviets. Hans Jahn was killed shortly after this exploit. Action groups of up to 60 volunteers parachuted far behind the lines to assist the partisans, such as Felix Schleffer's Group 117, which contributed greatly to the surrender of a division of 12,000 men. Scheffler himself, disguised as a military policeman, regulated the traffic in such a way that an entire convoy was ambushed by the partisans. Committee leaflets were dropped in mass over the German lines, and radio broadcasts were made to Germany and the Wehrmacht. This activity gave rise to some clandestine groups at the heart of the German army, in a security battalion in Frankfurt am Oder, in the Panzer School Division, in Bergen-Belsen, and in several units stationed in Bavaria and abroad. 
This led the Wehrmacht High Command to create on May 30, 1944, a special counter-propaganda staff and to assign to each division an SS officer in charge of this work. A special order signed by Keitel, Commander-in-Chief of the Wehrmacht, indicated that the relatives of the prisoners of war would be held responsible for the defections and would pay, quote, with their property, freedom, and life, unquote. Beginning in December 1944, all German soldiers were required to sign a circular that said, quote, The command has informed me that if I surrender to the Russians, my entire family, father, mother, wife, children, and grandchildren will be shot, unquote. The Gestapo added the usual procedures of secret warfare. Nazi agents pretended to be deserters in order to unmask the committee's action groups. The courts martial sentenced 24,500 German soldiers to be shot for anti-fascist activity, and thousands more to be imprisoned. The Free Germany Movement for the West, France, Belgium, and Luxembourg, was formed under the leadership of Otto Nybergall. Nybergall was the head of the KPD in Saarland from 1926 to 1935. He left Saarbrücken, where he had been elected when Saarland was annexed to the Reich. From the French-Belgian border, he was in charge of the KPD's clandestine power station for the Saarland and the Fowls, and from Forbach, he was in charge of the power station for the Rhineland. Arrested by Belgian police at the beginning of 1940, he escaped and took charge of the KPD for France, Belgium, and Luxembourg. He formed the Free Germany Movement for the West, bringing together KPD militants, militants assigned to the TA, anti-fascist soldiers, German socialists and Catholic political emigrants, and workers for the Tot organization. Responsible for the Southern Zone and Heinz Pries, former political commissioner of the Hans Beinler Battalion in Spain, who had escaped from a French concentration camp and became head of the KPD in Lyon, and by Walter Vesper, the former head of the TA of the FTP MOI in the Southern Zone. At the end of 1943, Harold Hauser, also an old KPD militant, took responsibility over the Northern Zone. Two weeklies were created in France by the committee which succeeded the publications produced by the KPD within the framework of the TA. In the Southern Zone, the committee published 25 issues of Un Surveyorland, and in the Northern Zone, 63 issues, each with a circulation of 200,000 copies, of Volk und Vaterland. Richard Gladowitz's organization infiltrated the Wehrmacht and engaged in sabotage and the detour of arms and money for the Maquis. The massive sending of foreign workers to Germany within the framework of the STO allowed the committee to send emissaries to the Reich under the cover of false French identities. In addition to its newspapers, the committee clandestinely published 109 different leaflets, five brochures, and a large number of circulars in France. The National Committee for a Free Germany formed fighting units in 25 departments that fought in the FTP Maquis, or practiced urban guerrilla warfare by attacking officers' clubs, Gestapo and military police posts. Max Linger and Ernst Schultz, among others, distinguished themselves in these battles. In brief, 350 soldiers and officers, partisans of the National Committee for a Free Germany, led by their colonel, joined the resistance. Several KPD Maquillards continued the war in the ranks of Colonel Fabian's regiment and participated in the liberation of Alsace. In Belgium, where the committee edited Freres Deutschland and the Freiheit Brief on die Deutsch Wurmhat, German anti-fascists participated in the armed struggle in the ranks of the Belgian Army of Partisans, APB Communist in Brussels, Walloon-Brabant, and Antwerp. Thus, in Antwerp, two German fighters from the APB shock group were killed in a fight with Gestapoists, and others were captured and transferred to Germany to be beheaded. More than 20 KPD militants died as a result of their involvement in the Belgian resistance. As Allied troops entered Germany, several clandestine organizations of the KPD and the National Committee for a Free Germany moved into open combat, not without casualties. The Free Germany Committee in Cologne, which had been founded in 1943 on the initiative of communist militants, had a core of more than 200 members and set out to bring together resistance fighters from all political and ideological backgrounds. Leaflets inciting the German population to commit sabotage in order to stop the Nazi war machine and encouraging soldiers to desert were distributed, and resistance fighters helped foreign force laborers. In November 1944, the Cologne Gestapo arrested 1,800 members and sympathizers of the group, murdered the main perpetrators, and thus succeeded in permanently dismantling the group in the city. On February 4th, Walter Ulbricht called for a popular uprising against Hitler on the committee's radio station. In the Kiel region, 
KPD shock troops boldly attacked DCA batteries and police stations. In Roklaw, Breslau, a KPD militant, Herman Hartman, organized about 100 militants in groups of three. Hartman's organization began urban guerrilla warfare, a grenade attack on a Nazi local, and the National Committee for a Free Germany sent him a reinforcement of 80 fighters from Soviet lines. The enlistment of all those who had not been mobilized in the army, teenagers, the elderly, the sick, the handicapped, into the ranks of the Volkssturm, and the extreme defenses around the cities were, in many places, if not prevented, at least weakened by the members and sympathizers of the committee. In Leipzig, Jena, Cologne, Gotha, Chemnitz, Karl Marx Stadt, Rostock, Stalsund, Grimmen, Greifswald, Borzau, Belzig, Freiburg, etc., several local committees arose at the time of liberation and established counterpowers. In Leipzig, the local Free Germany Committee had 4,500 members. On the arrival of the American forces, it had undertaken the first work of cleaning up the city and started denazification. Upon its arrival, the American army refused the anti-fascist candidate for mayor, appointed a conservative politician, and banned the committee. Chapter 7. Up to the Camps In the concentration and extermination camps, the SS employed a large number of prisoners as auxiliaries, chamber chiefs, barrack chiefs, office workers, team leaders in the construction sites and workshops, maintenance personnel, etc., Occupying one of these positions considerably increased the chances of escaping the appalling mortality rate in the camps. In 1941, 76% of Mauthausen's inmates died of malnutrition and ill treatment. Different networks fought against them by means of direct or indirect assassinations. Denunciation to the SS, transfer to a particularly murderous construction site, etc. The SS initially entrusted these posts to ordinary German prisoners but their theft and trafficking disrupted the order of the camps. KPD militants, identified as such or not, gradually overwhelmed the administration of the camps. They managed, through a centralized and rational use of the possibilities thus offered, to give the SS the appearance of, quote, good administration, unquote, while developing a vast network of solidarity and struggle. Wherever the KPD was able to infiltrate the camp apparatus, the conditions of the deportees improved, while ordinary German prisoners stole food from the prisoners and Polish and Ukrainian chauvinist organizations competed with the SS in the persecution of Jews and Russians. Wrong about the apparent, quote, goodwill, unquote, of German political prisoners, Himmler offered them freedom in October 1944 in exchange for an engagement in General Durlwanger's SS brigade. Durlwanger found the idea of, quote, fighting the Soviets with communists, unquote, ridiculous, and experience showed that he was right. Only 800 political prisoners agreed to join, and the result was catastrophic. In whole sections, 400 of them deserted a few months later, in the middle of the battle, putting the entire brigade in danger. A hundred of them managed to join the Red Army. The affair had a precedent. Earlier, prisoners who had finished their sentences, political and common rights, were transferred to the Wehrmacht's 999th Disciplinary Division and assigned to the occupation of Greece. The Communists reconstituted the party organization there and plundered the division's stocks for the benefit of the Communist Maquis of the ELAS, the National Liberation Army of Greece. Several deserted without looking back and became partisans, like Gerard Reinhardt, who was a captain in the ELAS. The German Communists established a clandestine organization in all camps. In Mauthausen, it was led by KPD Deputy Franz Dahlem. In Sachsenhausen in 1942, the Gestapoists attempted to strike the clandestine organization, quote, blindly, unquote. All prisoners who were members of the KPD and held, quote, civilian, unquote, positions were arrested, interrogated, and sent to particularly deadly building sites. They revealed nothing under torture, and the organization survived their loss. It was not until 1944 that the 200 snitches kept in the camp by the Gestapo enabled it to identify 160 members of the organization. Some of them were so tortured that they were carried on stretchers to the crematorium. On October 11th, the 27 main defendants, including three KPD deputies, were shot, but by this date the organization had already been reorganized. In November 1944, the clandestine organization in Dora was affected. The SS arrested, tortured, and murdered many communist cadres. Friedrich Prohl, who actually belonged to the leadership of the clandestine organization, was thrown into the dungeon. 
While waiting for torture, he got his last words out. Quote, don't be afraid. Tomorrow I will be dead and the dead no longer speak, unquote, and committed suicide. Dora's organization was reorganized by Albert Kuntz. Arrested on March 6, 1933, he was sentenced to three years of forced labor, but had never left the concentration camps. He was assassinated in 1945, along with George Thomas and Ludwig Sizak, two other German communists who had refused to hang escaped Soviet soldiers and were recaptured. The communist underground organization in Buchenwald was the most developed and effective. By the spring of 1942, it had taken control of almost all the quote, civilian unquote, functions of the camp. It saved the lives of many condemned to death. One of the procedures consisted of exchanging the identity of the condemned prisoner with that of an ordinary prisoner who had just died. The piece of skin tattooed with his number was removed from the condemned prisoner, and the number of the deceased prisoner was tattooed back on him. The clandestine organizations of Auschwitz and Mauthausen also succeeded in making such substitutions. Another procedure consisted in declaring the convict to be suffering from typhus and assigning him to the quarantine premises where the SS did not dare to enter. The Buchenwald organization succeeded in setting up the most highly developed medical system in the concentration camp world. Fully equipped with equipment stolen from the SS, it ensured food solidarity for the sick and the Soviet prisoners of war deprived of food it preserved the lives of party cadres. It set up an information service fed by a clandestine radio station that broadcast 26 issues of an information sheet and provided political theoretical training for the militants. It was at the origin of the creation of an international committee, ILK, by helping to set up a clandestine organization by nationality. Eleven national organizations were eventually members of the ILK. It achieved remarkable success in sabotaging the war production of factories, employing deported labor. In Dora, which depended on Buchenwald and where the V-2 rockets were produced, 80% of the production was scrapped. At the Guslav factory, production fell from 55,000 rifles to a few thousand with the beginning of concentration labor, and three-quarters of the production was sent back by the Wehrmacht as unusable. The plan was to produce 10,000 pistols per month, but production remained, quote, on trial, unquote, for two years. And in the meantime, an incredible amount of raw materials and energy was deliberately wasted. The clandestine organization set up a military branch, the International Military Organization, or IMO, with the prospect of an armed insurgency. At the time of the insurgency, the IMO had 91 rifles with 2,500 rounds of ammunition, a machine gun with 2,000 rounds of ammunition, 20 handguns, 200 Molotov cocktails, hand grenades, knives, shears, etc. In order to protect the secrecy of all this activity, it developed espionage of the SS authorities to the highest degree, and discreetly liquidated many snitches. The clandestine organizations in the camps were in contact with the party. Organizations from neighboring towns sent political material, food, and sometimes weapons to the camp. In Dachau, former camp inmate George Shearer headed a local KPD organization that prepared the armed release of prisoners. In Sastchenhausen, the escape of cadres was organized for the benefit of the KPD organization in Berlin. This was the case of the interbrigadist Herbert Shape, who escaped in April 1944, and Rudy Wunderlich and Richard Schmeink, who escaped in 1944. The proximity of the Oranienburg Sachsenhausen concentration complex to Berlin offered numerous possibilities for connections with the clandestine KPD. The 300 testimonies of French deportees collected by the Amake de Orionberg Schaschenhausen, evoke on numerous occasions the complicity of Berlin workers, with the deportees put to work in their factories. While the simple act of sharing a snack led German civilians into concentration camps, several of them passed on not only food, but also the communist underground press to the prisoners. In addition, they turned a blind eye to the sabotage of German and foreign deportees, or even sabotage themselves. They were a minority, of course, but a sufficiently representative minority to have marked the memory of many French deportees, and to have contributed to the failure of the production of the Heinkel 177 bomber. Out of the 120 planes built in 1943, none was usable. The KPD organized several ceremonies in the camps to honor its assassinated leaders. On two occasions, these ceremonies had tragic consequences. On August 18, 1944, after 11 years of torture, the SS murdered Ernst Tallman in the basement of the Buchenwald Crematorium, 
His prestige was such that they blamed the death on an American bombing raid in the hope of provoking dissension between communists and pro-Western opponents. A secret ceremony of homage was organized in Buchenwald itself. A snitch managed to catch it by surprise, and the Gestapo arrested several leaders of the organization, including KPD leader Robert Seward. All of them resisted terrible torture, and the secrets of the clandestine organization were preserved. Another informer denounced the ceremony of homage to KPD deputy Lambert Horn, who died in Sastchenhausen on June 2, 1939. The communists of the camp had marched in front of his body, one after the other, and there too the repression was bloody. In the last days of the camp, the Buchenwald organization succeeded in preventing the departure of 21,000 prisoners on the death marches, and finally, on April 11, 1945, triggered an armed insurrection. By the time the U.S. soldiers of the U.S. Third Army arrived in Buchenwald, the 850 IMO fighters had already liberated the camp in a brief but violent fight against the demoralized and rapidly disbanded SS. 150 SS guards had been captured, 1,500 rifles, 180 Panzerfaust, and 20 machine guns recovered. The first Allied officer to enter Buchenwald testified, quote, We entered the camp. No trace of fighting. There is practically no SS resistance. Here and there in the camp, we see some men who have already lost the appearance of political deportees. They carry grenades hanging from their belts, rifles, Panzerfaust. They give the impression of wanting to constitute a revolutionary force in the camp, unquote. An insurrection plan had also been drawn up at Mauthausen. The clandestine organization had prepared its shock groups armed with a machine pistol, 20 handguns, a few dozen grenades, Molotov cocktails, truncheons, and knives. The escape of the SS guards rendered the plan null and void. However, the combat groups of the clandestine organization recovered other weapons and for a few days they fired against Hitler's troops retreating in the region. Chapter 8. Lessons of Resistance, Reasons for Denial Show yourselves, just for an instant you, unknown men. You can cover your face while we utter our thanks. Bertolt Brecht the value of the alleged denazification of the FRG, Federal Republic of Germany, or West Germany, can be measured by the fact that, after war, none of the judges had to account for a single one of the thousands of death sentences for opponents they had pronounced between 1933 and 1945. Whereas any jurist who had collaborated in the elaboration or application of the Third Reich legislation was excluded from the judiciary in East Germany by 1955, 1,310 lawyers from the Nazi, quote, special courts, unquote, had returned to service in West German courts. These, quote, special courts, unquote, alone had handed down more than 50,000 death sentences. Set up in March 1933, they were placed outside public jurisdiction in order to, quote, totally exterminate the opponents of the Third Reich, unquote. This complacency of the FRG went very far. For example, Dr. Eric Onger, Former prosecutor at the Leipzig, quote, special court, unquote, had been found guilty of multiple legal assassinations and sentenced by an East German court in 1945. When he was released from prison, he fled to the FRG and was appointed prosecutor in Essen. One can imagine how these magistrates judged their former accomplices. They transformed the denazification of the FRG into a masquerade. There were only 5,234 convictions of Nazi murders in the FRG and these convictions were equivalent to an average of 10 minutes in prison per person murdered. In 1965, the FRG passed outright amnesty law. It was announced by federal president Heinrich Lübke. Heinrich Lübke was a former employee of the Gestapo in Stettin, and the former boss of the concentration labor in Pinamunde and Lu, a dependency of Buchenwald. Reporters and historians, as well as military personnel and jurists, benefited from this same treatment. All of them remained at their posts. It is not surprising that West German historiography has tried to conceal the communist resistance in order to nourish the thesis that, quote, we were all abused by Hitler, we were all victims of Hitler, unquote. While several recent papers describe this resistance facet by facet, region by region, the general tone is one of denial. For example, the catalog of the exhibition organized by the Bundestag and the Reichstag on the history of Germany devotes 30 lines to the conspirators of July 20th and a single line to the resistance. Quote, Social democratic and communist cells and clergymen, unquote. 
Putting these three resistances on the same level is already a sham. Only the communist resistance embraced all possible forms of struggle. Propaganda, sabotage, guerrilla warfare, espionage, union struggle, etc. It is the only one to have fought from the first day to the last day of the Third Reich, and to have extended its action to the whole of Germany, even in the camps and in the army. Finally, it is the only one to have really weakened the Nazi war machine. Christians and socialists most often opposed individually or within a small circle of close relatives. As for the famous conspiracy of July 20th, 1944, it was ambiguous to say the least. Behind the handsome figure of Colonel von Stauffenberg, the conspirator who placed the bomb against Hitler, who was a true anti-fascist patriot, there were soldiers, reactionary politicians, and capitalists, who until then had faithfully followed Hitler, and who had sometimes directly contributed to putting him in power. Half of the July 20th conspirators were closely associated with the Nazi project, and what they ultimately blamed Hitler for was failure, and leading Germany to defeat in a Soviet revolution. Their documents explicitly mention this fear, quote, The time has come to carry out this project, the coup, because the supreme moments are coming to an end. Otherwise, we will have to face a second November 1918 revolution, unquote. The emissaries of the conspirators promised the Westerners that they would withdraw all their units from the West and send them to the Eastern Front. They had even planned to welcome American airborne divisions to Berlin as soon as they had succeeded in their coup, so that the city would not be taken by the Soviet army. These proposals were made directly in Switzerland to Alan Dulles, head of the U.S. Secret Service in Europe. In this way, the plotters hoped to achieve a separate peace with the Western capitalist powers, and thus save what could be saved from imperialist and militaristic Germany. The writings of the head of the conspiracy, Karl Gerdeller, are revealing. In 1943, he still claimed the 1914 borders, including Alsace, Lorraine, Silesia, etc., quote, increased by the integration of Austria and the Sudetenland, unquote. The anti-communist crusade was at the heart of the project, quote, I can predict that a Germany which, in addition to an honest and competent military leadership, will have given itself, with the coup, a suitable, let's just say it, political leadership, will see the end of the air war, i.e. the Anglo-American bombings within 48 hours. The efforts that will follow can be devoted to the realization of a detente with the West, which will make possible the concentration of all the warlike power of the German people in the East, unquote. Gerdauer considered that by allying itself with Japan, Germany committed, quote, a betrayal of the interests of the peoples of the white race, unquote. The selfish motives of these, quote, resistance fighters, unquote, cherished by Western historiography, were manifested one last time in the spirit with which the majority of them denounced each other in the hope of saving their own skins. The obscuration of the German communist resistance is found in the French-language bibliography. There has never been a paper in French on the subject, except for a brochure once published in the GDR. There are only a handful of books in French focusing on particular aspects of German anti-fascist resistance in France and Belgium, and a few books dealing with German resistance, quote, in general, unquote, which reserve the corresponding portion for communists. For the rest, one will find mention of communist resistance only in books dealing with related subjects, Soviet espionage, concentration camps, Jewish resistance, the Gestapo, the Spanish War, etc., Against this scarcity, one can contrast the incredible number of books, articles, television programs, and even films devoted to the plotters of July 20th, 1944, and to the small group of the White Rose composed, it must be recalled, of a handful of students and their philosophy teacher. Contemporary ideological stakes must be important if the resistance of tens of thousands of communists to Hitlerism is to be concealed in this way. The issue is not mysterious. Not a day goes by without an article or a program attempting to substantiate the myth of the, quote, twin brothers, unquote, communism and fascism. Even perceived as a distant threat, communism remains the enemy for a bourgeoisie that yesterday put Hitler in power to protect itself from Bolshevism, and today stands as the champion of anti-fascism. In order to arrange things this way in the social consciousness, a vast undertaking of historical revisionism was necessary. To make the bourgeoisie look like anti-fascists and the communists look like the Nazis' alter ego. The success of the ideological concept of, quote, totalitarianism, unquote, forged for the occasion, gives the measure of this propaganda, as does the success of anti-communist myths repeated ad nauseum. 
Take, for example, the myth of the quote transition unquote from the KPD to the NSDAP. The election results prior to Hitler's seizure of power show that, despite the Nazi attempts to mobilize the industrial proletariat, the NSDAP's progress was achieved by absorbing the electorate of the two liberal parties, representing the peasantry and the middle class, by mobilizing the regular abstainers and the new voters, and not at the expense of the KPD. The KPD even grew to the point of having a record 100 deputies in the November 1932 elections. The failure of the National Socialist Factory Cell Organization, NSBO, testifies to the lack of Nazi presence in the German working class. In the spring of 1933, elections to the work councils gave the Nazis only 11.7% of the vote. Workers were the only social group whose percentage of Nazi party members was lower than its percentage in the total population. The NSBO was paralyzed by the privileged links between the Nazi party leadership and German big capital. In April 1933, Rudolf Hess had forbidden any NSBO demonstration against a private company, industrial firm, or bank without the authorization of the NSDAP. The confidential guidelines for the fulfillment of our struggle in the decisive year 1932 against corporate Marxism insists that the NSBO is not a trade union, that it does not give any financial support to the strikers. It reads, quote, The noblest task of the National Socialists in the factories is the struggle for our movement and for the annihilation of the enemy. No matter in what form the enemy comes to us, whether it is the KPD, the RGO, Communist Trade Union, or the social democratic and Christian semi-Marxist trade unions that follow them, our struggle concerns all these formations. Every national socialist is furthermore obliged to establish the identity of every Marxist delegate in the company, regardless of its nuance, and to provide his or her exact address. Whenever possible, he must try to obtain a photograph of these people. If the boss is a member of our party, he has the right to be constantly informed. It is also important to point out to our fellow bosses that, in the face of possible indispensable wage cuts, the National Socialist personnel will show a completely different understanding of the economic situation than personnel excited by Marxists, unquote. After the burning of the Reichstag, the regime satisfied all the demands of the capitalist. Any incitement to strike was punishable by one month to three years in prison. Employees were not allowed to change employers, but the authorities could move them without taking into account their wishes and without them keeping the wages of their previous jobs. The old collective agreements were replaced by wages fixed by company managers, etc. The NSBO's role was to supervise the German worker, at no time, to represent his interests. Those who wanted to do some semblance of union work were thrown into concentration camps for, quote, seeking to perpetuate the class struggle under the auspices of National Socialism, unquote. Goering instructed the police, quote, to act energetically against those members of the enterprise cells, who have not yet understood the true character of the Third Reich, unquote. It could not have been put better. The resistance of the German people to Hitlerism was less than the KPD had hoped for. The hope for a general anti-Hitler insurrection was very high among the communists, especially when the defeat of the Third Reich was evident. This hope was based on the bankruptcy of the regime, the vertiginous degradation of the living conditions of the masses, bomb cities, 60-hour minimum work week, famine, and the historical precedent of 1918. The military dispositions of the KPD organizations, even those operating in the concentration camps, were conceived in the perspective of this popular uprising that never took place. The fault certainly does not lie with the communist resistance, which was vast, deep, and heroic. This resistance demonstrates that, whatever the scale and ferocity of the repression, the experience of struggle and organization of the communist movement gives revolutionaries the methods to get through the worst ordeals, provided they show sufficient determination. Quote, the worst enemy of the party is not the Gestapo, it is panic, unquote, Eric Wolweber used to say. The worst chains are those which the oppressor forges in the heads of the oppressed. The anti-Nazi resistance of the KPD carried out in inconceivable difficulties and at the cost of unheard of sacrifices, is not only a page of glory, but also a valuable experience for the communist movement. This is more than enough to explain the wretched lies of official history written about it.